what we're seeing right now is severe dislocations in the labor market, right? We're seeing supply and demand imbalances. Equities generally are reflecting a path of policy tightening. Certainly the Fed could use any help from any front it can get at this point. The Fed ultimately, through its action, at a minimum, is going to cause a mild recession. This is going to be a challenging back-to-school season. It could be a challenging Christmas season. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Do you remember a week ago today, Tom? Exactly. Cold, well said, John. No, thank you. Live from New York City <clears> this morning. Good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio. Alongside Tom Keane, I'm Jonathan Farrow, together with Anna Edwards. Bramo back after the long weekend. Equities unchanged on the session. TK, we are down on the week. And every day since yeah. Chairman Powell spoke last Friday, yields inching higher at the front end. This will be a different jobs day. We will cover the American labor economy, the report of mystery. We'll have to see what it's like after last time's festivities. But, John, these markets say it can't be a normal jobs day. Yen, where it is, Philippine peso, truly record weakness. Well, Tom, last month there was nothing normal about it. 528, today the estimate 298, a week full of better-than-expected data. ISM manufacturing right. better than expected, claims lower than <clears throat> expected, consumer confidence firmer than expected. Tom, that's been the theme of the week. Yeah. And you know you hate this and I hate it too, but... Good news has been bad news. Oh, uh, you're going to start right in on that. Just Jim, go straight there. John, Jim Glassman was maybe the best interview I've had with him yesterday for 35 years. What did he say, Tom? The giant of J.P. Morgan Chase. He was heated that the gloom crew has it wrong. Heated. And does the gloom crew get a bit of fuel for their debate a little bit later? Yeah, well, let's see if good news... Uh, well, if there is good news, does it turn out to be bad, as we've seen recently, John? Yeah, the gloom crew dominates. I mean, all the conversations we have with those in equities, certainly... I mean, it's difficult to find those who are positive. Every now and again, we find one, but they're scarce. We've established that good news is bad news. Is bad news good news? Anna, do we know? No, no. I thought I read okay, yesterday. I, I read yesterday ten, from one of our guests that bad news is definitely still bad news. So basically, everything's bad. A TK, Sorry, I can't, I I can't keep up. Friday message. But Tom, you're up to speed on this, and this is the problem. Bloomberg News wrote a great story about this yesterday. If I could guarantee you the number today at 8:30 Eastern, if I could tell you it right uh, now, I, would you know, know how to trade it <clears throat> a minute afterwards, Tom? Would you John, know how to trade it? No, you, you wouldn't, and there's been some real losses taken here. Let's remember that. There are some winners, obviously, out there. Steve Whiting's going to join us in a moment. John, what do we have to fall back on? The data screen that Tom Secunda and Mike Bloomberg uh, invented. And I'm sorry, I got a 352 year. I got a yen at a one unimaginable 40. This tells me right now is a unique job. And I've got another bank, Tom, looking for a 75 <clears throat> basis point hike from yeah, the ECB course. next yeah. week. City in the well, mix, and maybe another 75 basis point John, hike in the meeting after that. Let's do this right now. Sure. And, you know, it, it's it, we got it, time's precious here, but I'm sorry. Ambrose Evans Pritchard lays out the John Farrow watch Italy scenario today in the Telegraph. This this has national consequences for them to go 75 beeps. The spread of Italy over Germany right now, Tom, 236. So Badra Japa, I'll catch up with her later <clears throat> from Sokgen. She says that spread, Tom, could blow out to 300 basis points. I mean, I mean, it's so unimaginable, you'd actually think Americans would buy AC Milan. I mean, it's unbelievable. Well, they're doing it, Tom. <laughs> Yankees taking a little stake in that. Do you want to talk about that later? We'll talk about that later. we got too much to do right to it. now. It's payrolls yeah. Friday, Tom. I yes. can tell you're excited. Futures up a tenth of 1% on the S&P. Good morning to you. On the Nasdaq 100, we are dead flat. It's just the churn, the quiet, the peace <clears> and quiet, the snooze. Before the big one at 8.30, then 8.31, it's Operation Get to the Beach for the long weekend stateside. Do you know how this works? 3.25. 5.95 on a US 10 year. Tom talked about a two year breach in 350, just south of that level right now. Euro dollar basically unchanged at parity, but looking for a move of a stronger euro through much of this week, Tom. Will we get it today? We're breaking out by about six tenths of 1% right now, unchanged on much of the week so far. Let's get to Steve Whiting, Chief Investment Strategist and Chief Economist at City Global Wealth Management. He joins us now. Steve, I'm going to go to the question that we've debated all week, and forgive me for coming there first. We understand okay. that good news is apparently bad news. If we got a bad print today, what would it mean for this market? Well, bad print today, I think uh, it would be very difficult to think that it would do anything other than delay the approach of the Fed. Might buy us a little bit of time. Uh, time is what we've needed, and it's time is not what they're giving us. So in other words, this period where we're still seeing rising employment and we're seeing falling inflation rates now, this is a little bit of a period where we can have some hope 
um, of growing through this shock. But I doubt that uh, a single month of data, I mean, consider what we're looking at in the month of August. It's mostly seasonal adjustment. It's a period, again, of weakness in the summer months. That's very, very seasonal, large, large swings. We uh, to use all of the seasonal adjustment to show us a number, and we're supposed to figure out economic policy for the country on that. Steve Whiting, you look at a basic textbook like Dornbush Fisher Stars, which is the one I was weaned on, the great Rudy Dornbush with Stan Fisher, and you're the only economist I know that read Chapter 19, which is linking the financial markets back to the economic babble. What do you say about corporate margins, given the stew, as Lisa would say, the toxic brew that we're in right now? Do we have a gloom about corporate margins? I think we do. Um, this has been a strong, strong period. 2022 will be another year of record high corporate profits. And everyone says, well, I haven't seen the weakness yet. Well, not yet is not relevant. It really is what will we do next year? Uh, and that's the trouble here. Again, if you have uh, a roaring hot labor market, if you have all of this strength contribute to a higher top, you're going to have a bigger problem next year. Now, again, I don't think we have had uh, any kind of economic boom, like if you look back, for example, the mid-2000s in housing or the late 1990s in technology, these types of booms that were very, very difficult. We had a very long way to drop. I don't think we have that in the American economy, but we're still looking for a 10 percent drop in corporate profits next year. A 10 percent drop. Where does that put SPX? I mean, you're linking both markets here. It's a fair question to you, given Close all that you time. do for Citigroup. What's your standard and poor's target? Uh, so, look, I think we're not going to make a lot of progress in broad averages. And we've not argued that, OK, well, it's really, uh, you know, that June low, we've got to go back and, and drop that a little bit more. That's not really what we're thinking about here. But we think it's been premature to discount a new economic recovery cycle when we haven't even seen the drop yet. Again, we're not expecting it to be some severe systemic collapse in the economy. Mm -hmm. This is an overheating. It's being driven by the Federal Reserve. We're seeing housing and autos, for example, very traditional parts of the economy uh, weaken and not from very high levels. We're not even satisfying demand for housing and autos right now in the United States. But both supply and demand are likely to drop some. Um, I think okay. we'll have a recovery in 2024, but it's just too early to say, well, this is the time where, you know, the bear market is over, two down quarters for GDP growth. Uh, let's go back to the races. So, Steve, you, you're talking about a 10% drop in earnings next year. What does that do to dividends? I know that you think that's an important uh, story to, to keep watching. Uh, I'm thinking because of the drop in earnings, but also perhaps in some sectors, political pressure, if wages are not keeping up with inflation. Well, depending on the conditions, we're going to see some sectors that will halt dividends. Um, you will see, again, uh, a slowing growth rate. Uh, but for most of the companies that actually pay a dividend, um, again, there's going to be a pretty good choice there to make. Um, we, uh, again, are very focused on City Global Wealth on firms that have the most consistent track record of raising dividends. Dividend aristocrats have done so for 25 years in the U.S. market, and that's through three economic cycles. The healthcare sector, our biggest single industry overweighted pharma, uh, has grown dividends through every recession. 6% growth rate, not not wonderful, but 3% yield, 6% uh, growth rate. That is a very dependable source of return at a time when the economy is facing this headwind. Steve, just finally, what would you need to see that would make you bullish again? What could develop? Because a lot of people are just um, writing off September already. What would you need to see? Well, look, um, falling inflation and some recognition from the Fed that what the world doesn't need now is higher unemployment, right? We're not going to set this uh, into a downturn that becomes self-reinforcing in the labor markets. Once we start seeing employment decline, it'll keep declining for most of a year. It's possible. It's possible still to avoid that. It does look like, again, the Federal Reserve is on its way, though. Uh, again, to setting us into one of those cycles, in which case they will ease again when employment is falling. And they may say, no, we're not going to do that right now. <laughs> uh, but when actual employment is falling again, not rising 300,000 sure. per month, not rising at a slower pace, you know, that's probably next year. 
happens, not this year. It's going to be a major test for this central bank, for this country, that's for sure. Steve, awesome to catch up. Steve Whiting there of City Global Wealth Management going into payrolls a little bit later this morning, 8.30 Eastern time. So in about two hours and 20 minutes, we're looking for a number <coughs> close to 300K, Tom, after a blowout jobs report yeah. just a month ago. Well, it's going to be interesting to see that number, and I'm going to be looking at wages, particularly off the new ADP, which I don't want to link to it. But I think the wage dynamics there, some of the little tea leaves, John, are interesting. Antoinette Antonio up at WCVB in Boston tweets out, under $4 a gallon gas in Massachusetts, $3.97. You know, it gets my About attention. About where the average is, Tom. We've yeah. broken down. You know, it was a fear we'd break through six at some leaves. point this summer. Yeah. Hasn't happened. It hasn't happened. And I think you're going to see some people. I think Mike McKee was talking up used cars as well as, as being an interesting metric here. The labor market data so far so good, Tom. Yeah. And I mentioned that the data this week so far so Can good. We? Steve Whiting said that to expect the breakdown of the labor market, Tom, a story for 2023. Yeah. That's going to keep this Fed busy uh, John, into year end. Our, our whole team's on vacation. We had security guys out at the front door booking the show. We got a great set of guests coming up. Bramo took the long weekend, didn't she, Tom? Did you notice that? I did notice that. She's going to be back I think the, the last I time I had a day off, I think, was... Um, that feels like it's know, out of choice, Tom. I think the Red Sox were hopeful. Why then. is that? Why have you been so reluctant to take a bit of time I, I've off I've done this. this There's been a lot of years I've done this. I just like the autumnal mist. I like to, okay. you know, take you're, the day off. for the leaves to start to fall, quote, and then you're going to the, take some the time The leaves off. get brown, as you say. And old school. I quote Robert Frost, and, you know... Very old school. I, I tweeted out a picture of your shoes a little bit earlier, Tom. Some confusion. Yeah. As to whose shoes they might be. Oh, no. Now everyone knows. Gotcha. And if you want to check them out, go on Twitter yeah. and have a little look. It's pretty obvious which shoes are mine. They made a splash in the busy. Which shoes are Tom's. They're going to stop traffic later, Tom. Coming up, 7 a.m. Eastern time. Priya Misra of TD. <clears throat> TK Water Cool from Priya earlier this year. Call, call of the summer, seriously. Just awesome. Call of the summer, no end of her butts. On the yield curve, looking forward yeah. to catching up with her. And Carl Riccadonna making a comeback over at BNP Paribas. Is he new? He is new. Okay. A new seat for him. Looking forward to that. Okay. Catch up with Randy Krosner. Tom mentioned him a little bit earlier this nervous. morning. And Jeff Rosenberg of BlackRock after the payrolls print later on. From New York City, good morning to you all. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Ritika Gupta. President Biden has given a preview of what his campaign message will be in the run-up to November's congressional elections. Last night, he accused Donald Trump and Republicans who back him of endangering democracy. Donald Trump and the MAGA Republicans represent an extremism that threatens the very foundations of our republic. House Republican leader Kevin McCarthy accused the president of slandering all Republican voters. Today's U.S. jobs report could tip the scales towards a third straight jumbo-sized interest rate hike. According to a Bloomberg survey, employers added 298,000 jobs in August, and the jobless rate stayed at 3.5 percent. That matches the lowest in five decades. Those figures could be enough to lead the Fed to raise rates by another 75 basis points to fight inflation. In Argentina, a man was arrested after pointing a gun at Vice President Cristina Fernandez de Kirchner and pulling the trigger. The gun did not fire and the man was arrested. He was described as a Brazilian with a history of carrying weapons. The incident comes at a time at which Argentina is bitterly polarized after years of economic crisis and political infighting. Bloomberg's learned that Japan's SoftBank is planning to cut at least 20% of the staff at its Vision Fund operation. The world's biggest tech investor will slash a minimum of 100 positions. Earlier this summer, the Vision Fund posted a record $23 billion loss. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. Donald Trump and the MAGA Republicans represent an extremism that threatens the very foundations of our republic. They live not in the light of truth, but in the shadow of lies. But together, together we can choose a different path. An address to the nation by the president of the United States from New York City this morning. Good morning with Tom Keane and Anna Edwards. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Bramo's going to be back 
on Tuesday. Futures unchanged on the S&P 500. The Nasdaq 100 negative by around about two tenths of one percent. Down 23 points going into payrolls a little bit later this morning. Two hours and 12 minutes away. Looking for something close to 300k. <coughs> Yields unchanged. 325.75 on a 10-year. The two years been creeping higher ever since yeah. Chairman Powell spoke last Friday, Tom. A brief breach of about 350 on a uh, two-year. Uh, John, I want to go to the real yield here very quickly before Jeff Fitzpatrick. What an explosion we saw yesterday in the inflation-adjusted yield out to 0.8042. Dare I say a positive 1% figures somewhere out there on the horizon. John, that changes your discussion this afternoon. I couldn't agree more, Tom, and we're starting to get round to those levels that we hit in late 20. 2018, yeah. where the credit market really seized up and the Fed had to back away. And most people agree that this is very, very different. And right. I think for anyone in the fixed income market, right. Tom, they've got to consider what that means for corporate credit. John, have you been to Independence Hall in Philadelphia? I haven't, Tom. It is extraordinary. For those of you that haven't, it has been restored 14 times or whatever since 1780. It is really quite moving in what the National Park Service has done, particularly in piecing back together our belief of what the assembly room looked like as they pieced together the Declaration of Independence and the future of America. The scene last night for the President of the United States, Jack Fitzpatrick briefs from Washington this morning. Are we going to see more of this, Jack? Is the President going to dash to the first Tuesday of November with events like this? Yeah, it sounds like it. Uh, you know, I, I think this clearly was a, 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 an attempt to establish <laughs> A uh, strong campaign message. Uh, aside from what you've heard from Democrats on their legislative accomplishments, aside from the economy, uh, the president has made it very clear that this is a significant focus. This wasn't. A, they, he did almost back-to-back <coughs> -back speeches. Uh, his speech on Tuesday was pretty similar, uh, yeah. followed by this higher-profile speech on Thursday. And it did stand out that he immediately named Donald Trump, which he had previously not been doing. He had, he talked about the issues January. 6th, but made it less Trump-focused. Right. Uh, this was a, a speech about those issues, but also directed much more strongly toward Trump, and it, it seems to be <clears> something <throat> that President Biden wants to play up pretty significantly over the next couple of months. A completely unfair question, but to get us to the Sunday talk shows, you'll hear many of those on Bloomberg Radio. Jack, I, is this a president with the body language of considering a second term at his age, or is this a one-term president leading the troops to November? I, you know, it's hard to predict because he would not want to give any signs that he might not run again leading up to the midterms. Uh, that would not help him. It wouldn't help his party. But, I, I mean, he's going out there uh, it, with campaign-style speeches that are at least quite energetic, looking at the one last night. So he is in campaign mode. He's not giving okay. off signs that he's not going to run. But the concerns are there. You've heard even from Democrats. Democratic lawmakers that he, they don't think he's going to run. Uh, so I wouldn't say that's predictive. Mm. Uh, Jack, good to speak to you. O oil prices, gas prices have clearly been a big domestic issue. That takes on international context when you look at higher commodity prices uh, in recent months. I, I note a red headline across the Bloomberg tells us that the G7 is set to back a plan to introduce a cap on the price of Russian oil. I know from a European perspective there's been a lot of scepticism on whether a cap will work. How do you get the rest of the world involved? The US says the rest of the world can use that as leverage. Um, anything you can add on the, on the domestic side of this, how this is set to play out domestically? Uh, domestically, you know, it, on, on Capitol Hill, it, this is the kind of thing that there would probably be a lot of support for, uh, especially considering what you just mentioned about the U.S. argument that even if this is not uh, massively widespread, uh, this agreement to limit uh, the price uh, of payments on Russian oil, then that would ha still have an effect on what other countries would pay because of how it factors into negotiations. Um, it, it, talking to lawmakers, seeing the, the action outside of just the administration, there's a lot of pressure to find whatever uh, points they can to, to increase pressure on Russia. So domestically, uh, this, this could be fairly popular. Popular, but it, 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 that doesn't answer all the questions about uh, the extent of how many countries participate in the international questions. I think we're all trying to work out how this works in practice. Jack Fitzpatrick there, down in D.C. Jack, thank you. Hey, Tom, look, you mentioned it earlier, with below $4 on gasoline. 
I yeah. think that's a massive improvement from where we were in the middle of June, June oh. 13th, north of $5. And there was a fear. You remember that note from JP Morgan at the start of summer that maybe we could get through $6 yeah. a gallon on gasoline yeah. in America? Didn't get there. Rolled over 383 at the moment, Tom. Oh, on average. I'm going to pick on the guy that I know best on this, David Rosenberg, uh, iconic at Merrill Lynch years ago, and of course with his own shop up in Toronto. But what's so important here, John, is the media focuses on just emotional things of inflation, used cars, rents, housing. It's all many, many little pieces. And you got to parse all that out, and it may parse towards a disinflationary tendency. But, John, does that get you from eight, nine down to seven, which is unacceptable, no question? down to five, or where after that is a huge debate. Well, you've raised the question, Tom, what happens if we settle down at five? And exactly. where does that leave the Fed? Fed's on a raise and hold. I caught up with Daryl Cronk yesterday, and we've been talking about He's peak good. inflation, peak hawkishness for so long. There's a P word we need to discuss even more after last <laughs> Friday, Tom. It's persistence. This Fed's going to get rates up there and hold them there. It's a the takeaway of the last week for a lot of people. They yeah. could do a lot of damage, too. Well, they could. I mean, and the... The trends here, and you know, we haven't talked much about Europe this morning because it's job day and that. But o't. I'm sorry, the European dynamic, John, is is factors worse. Well, it's I mean, brutal, Tom. Stunning. I mean, the difference between the Fed and the ECB, both central banks are set to hike 75 basis points. There's a debate as to whether the Fed goes and drives this economy into a into a recession, Tom. In Europe, no one's even questioning that. It's just about how deep it's going to be, Tom. It's pretty messy stuff. On the ECB yeah. into next week. John, can I just digress as the president spoke at Independence Hall? I mean, I'm looking at him in the lights with Dr. Biden there. And it reminded me of old White Hart Lane. And, you know, I just think the can you imagine if I said that, how offended something. Americans might be? The Tots I said that. could do something to give it the majesty of Independence Who Hall. Who are you playing later this weekend? I, you know, I haven't even looked. I haven't even looked I, I'm still getting over West Ham tie. What Nate Shelley did to us, it's just unbelievable. TK, it's painful. When's the third season of Ted Lasso out? I don't, Anna, do you know when's Ted Lasso out? I don't know. No idea. Futures, down a tenth on the S&P on the NASDAQ. Euro above parity. Down about a third of 1%. Just about, Tom. Yeah. Yields, 326 on a 10-year. More on the markets up next with Sarah House on This Economy. This is Bloomberg. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning. Down on the week, down on the session. We're down about a tenth of 1% on the S&P 500. On the Nasdaq 100, down about a third of 1%. Yesterday, just about getting a day of gains, but still a close below 4K. Michael Hartnett out of Bank of America out this morning with the flow show. That's his weekly note. Yeah. Pointing out that, Tom, they'd take a nibble at 3,600, 3,700. That's his first nibble. Yeah. It's not here. That's for sure. Everybody's got an opinion on this. I'm going to stay of out of that, John. I will say the VIX has been constructive. You'd think with the agony out there, John, we popped out to 30, 31, 32. No, that didn't happen. 27 level. And right now with the better market yesterday, 25.46. I don't think anyone's prepared to call this panic, Tom. That's for sure. Even after the steep losses of the last week, even after this move at the front end There's of the yield so curve on twos. There's out there. Every single day. I agree with you, TK. Oh, I'm trying to find a bull. I had complaints about that oh, yesterday. There's out there, yeah. There's some yeah, I had out complaints there. too. I had Marco Kalanovic over stick. at JP Morgan. Yeah. John Stolfus being another one at Oppenheimer. I Credit Suisse is optimistic. I think they're Sure, Jonathan Golub has yeah. been, yeah. No. 350 on a two year, so we're above <clears> those kind of levels now. 349.85, well, just dancing around 350. Tom, before today, every single day since Friday, yields higher yes. at the front end yeah. after Chairman Powell. I think the market got the message. It, this is really important as people reset over Labor Day weekend. This is about four markets. It's not just about the stock market. We can focus, John, on Michael Wilson and others talking about earnings and challenges. We heard that from Steve Whiting. But I agree with you, the, the bond market's speaking volumes here. And the 10-year as well, back at 326. Yeah. A lot of people got very comfortable with the idea. We've seen the high for the year. Yeah. They're starting to get uncomfortable right now. BMO Ian Leon was on this show yesterday, and he said if we get to 350 on 10s, that's a great buy. So we'll see how much buying comes in as the yield pushes a little bit higher again today. I want to go over to Europe just briefly Please. and talk about the dollar strength we've seen. Euro dollar in and around parity through much of this week, essentially unchanged. Today, firmer by about a half of 1%, 99.97 on euro dollar. But it's really about that spread now between yeah. Germany and Italy. 230 basis points-ish through much of this week. 395 on a 10-year in Italy. Let's call it 160 on a 10-year over in Germany. So Bandra Japan and the team over at SockGen saying that spread could go as wide as 300 basis points, Tom. And this is the issue, I think, that 
a lot of people have got right now, even if we go to, say, higher unemployment, year <laughs> end for the Federal right. Reserve, they're not going to turn around and pull a U-turn. Yeah. That's the communication so far. And even if that spread blows out, even if we get a recession in Europe, the ECB is determined to go again. City out this morning, Tom, teeing up maybe 75 at the meeting next week and perhaps even 75 uh, I again. Don't, and we're not have, talking about I, the Fed. We're talking about the ECB. But, Tom, the fact we're having that conversation is a right. major change from where yeah. we were. I like what he just a month the ago. Telegraph today, John, on Italy, where he just took it from when Draghi stepped in for public service and how much it's deteriorated from the technocrat taking over. TK, it's easy to keep yeah. a lid on these kind of things when inflation <clears> is low. <throat> Inflation's not low and rates are going the other way. Yeah, Central I... bank's not there in the same yeah. way anymore. The Fed yeah. for the equity market, the ECB for the bond market. I'm going to go to your uh, sterling, rather, 115.60, maybe a little bit of a breather here. You looked early morning when I first took a look at the phone, folks. It's sterling to 114, unimaginable. Uh, yen, 140.35 also gets my attention. We're bouncing around between these incredible markets. Of course, Anna Edwards watching the politics of the United Kingdom. And, of course, it is Jobs Day in America, so stay with us on this Friday into the long weekend. Sarah House briefs us now, senior economist at Wells Fargo. Sarah, let me start with a stupid question. What's your NFP number this morning? Are you at 300 or are you moving around? So we've actually bumped our number up a little bit. We're at 375. And I think part of that right. reflects the fact that we did see a really strong ISM manufacturing number. And also just as we sit back and think about <clears throat> some of the, the structural elements we're seeing right now, we're still right. seeing a lot of new business formation suggesting that the birth death model uh, boost is, is still yeah. pretty strong. Jim Glassman of J.P. Morgan, iconic, was heated yesterday that it's better than the gloom crew says. Wells Fargo shares that heritage with the work of John Sylvia and Mr. Bryson and all the other people you have. Do you think the gloom crew is wrong on the American labor economy? So I think directionally the, the consensus is right. I think we are seeing signs of the labor market cooling. I think what's been tricky is, is, to, is to, to fine tune the degree of that. And what we've seen over the past few months from the payrolls data, from some of the more recent data on things like jobless claims stabilizing, the still very elevated rate of job openings, the fact that we really haven't seen quits come down at all, is that there's still a lot of resilience in this, in this labor market. There's still very durable demand for workers and you have to think about what that means for the income trajectory even in this high inflation environment is if you have strong hiring you have you have decent income growth even against the, these high price movements. Sarah forgive me for not looking ahead to 830 I want to look back to 528,000 a month ago I'm still blown away from that Sarah what was that? So I think in part it was perhaps the seasonal still particularly difficult in July. And then, you know, going back into this birth death model factor, we had the, the contribution for, for July was about, uh, was more than twice what it is over the past five years. And so that was coming at a month when the seasonals actually expect to decline. So that really gave a, gave a boost there. We think that overstates the, the underlying run rate of payroll growth right now. But I think even accounting for that, we're still looking at very, very strong job growth uh, consistent with the uh, elevated high plans we continue to see from things like the small business survey. So how sensitive do you think the Fed is on September, to September 21 to this data point and CPI on the 13th? I just wonder how important it actually is, given that the chairman has basically told us that the story is much bigger than that. Yeah, so I mean, I think it still plays a role in, in whether it's 50 or 75 for, for September. I think it will tilt the scales. I don't think it, it's going to settle the matter. We'll leave that for the inflation numbers that we get out on, on September 13th. But I think when we look at this report, there is inflation data in this report with average hourly earnings. And I think that's been one of the perhaps underappreciated aspects of the inflation outlook right now is, yes, we're seeing some relief in supply chains. We're seeing commodity prices come down, but that only gets you so far if if you still have elevated wage growth in terms of bringing inflation back down to 2%. Right now, we're still seeing average hourly earnings, ECI, both running around 5% annualized. And even if you give uh, some, some generous assumptions about what, what, what the true trend in productivity is right now, that just doesn't cut it in getting mm. inflation back to 2%. Sarah, a, a good, good, uh, good morning from London. What if we have all these interest rate hikes from the Fed and they don't cause pain in the labour market? The Fed has said it will tolerate a little bit of pain, but what if the two are a little disconnected because of the tightness of the labour market right now? 
So I think it all comes down to to what we see in those earnings in those earnings numbers. So uh, I think that's really what what the you know where the Fed's willing to withstand some pain is they need to get the average hourly earnings and essentially that inflationary pressure coming from the the labor market needs needs to be reduced. And so you know whether we end up seeing the inflation or sorry the unemployment rate rise back to you know a little over four percent like the Fed projects, a little <laughs> over five percent like we currently project through. The, through the end of next year, I think where where that tolerance lies comes down to what it's going to take to get inflation back down to target. That was the message from Jackson mm. Hole that they are laser focused on this and uh, yes. open and willing to accept some some collateral damage. And I wonder how much those uh, those workers on the on the sidelines, those who are not participating, how much they're focused on that high inflation number. Is there a sense that as inflation becomes more persistent or if it is or stays at elevated levels, at least, does that bring more people back into the labor market? I think the elevated price environment does act as a push factor for sideline workers back into the labor market. But I think there's also a pull factor with this still exceptionally strong demand. And I think one of the things we learned from the last cycle is that participation is slow to respond to, to conditions. So yes, we've seen the participation rate edge down since March. The household survey can be pretty volatile month to month, but I think there's still a lot of reasons to be, optimism, to be optimistic that we do get some improvement in, in labor force dynamics in the coming months, given some of, again, that, that push factor from, from inflation, pu um, pushing people back into the labor market to deal with these high prices, but just as well as the pull factor of still tremendous opportunities in, in the jobs market right now. That is the secret sauce for a soft landing, without a doubt, as part of it. Sarah, thank you. Sarah House of Wells Fargo. Always appreciate your time. Tom, I think a lot of the economists on Wall Street this week on the same page that we've seen some pretty resilient data. This was Neil Dutter out of Renaissance Macro, of course, good friend of this program over the years. Yeah, it's, okay. it's all right, isn't it? <laughs> if slowing the jobs market is a necessary condition to achieve the Fed's inflation objectives, the Fed is far from declaring mission accomplished. He goes on to say, claims have declined for three weeks. The ISM Manufacturing Employment Sub-Index just rose to 54.2, the highest since March. So, Tom, there you go. A lot of people speaking, singing from the same hymn sheet going into this one. Uh, Mr. Dutta has been a uh, died optimist through all of his cycle, all of his history, including, you know, Carl Riccadon is coming on uh, later with BNP Paribas. Uh, John, it's a confusing time, and in, in what I think we need to remember and really dovetails the market moves of this Friday with the labor interest here in two hours. What really matters here is how unusual the supply side is. Um, this is an original moment that we're in, and anybody with certitude, I'm laughing them out of the room. Sarah touched on it, Tom, <clears throat> with the participation rate. That's the big issue. And I think the big takeaway this week, Anna, since Chairman Powell spoke last week, is that this Fed has more work to do. Every single data point has just spoken to that mm. theme. This Fed has more work yeah. to do. Yeah, and we had hawk hawkishness, of course, oh. at Jackson Hole, as you guys witnessed, but there's more of it. We've seen every single voice since being more and more hawkish. And, and to the two of you, since it is the British show, the two of you, the conversation we just had on America is completely foreign to the conversation going on in England, right? It sounds somewhat bitter there about this. There are similarities somewhat in a tight labour market. About this you have a tight labour market in, in England. I mean, it's... A tight labour market. Yeah, absolutely. Add in a sprinkle in a little bit of Brexit on top of the, the, all the same factors you're dealing with. Can we yeah. get no sprinkles of Brexit on this programme, Anna? Sprinkles of Brexit. I've been trying to avoid that for about six years. That's like a Three show. Dog Night song from years ago. What's that, Tom? Uh, I got buy that Sprinkles of Brexit. Do you, want to, do you want to explain who that is? Chuck, who, who Three Dog Night is? Yeah, please do. John, that's we've done un -American. This, we've, we've done this before. Chuck we've Negron. Talked about that. Chuck Years Negron ago. got no together with the other two. They pieced the band together, mm. and they said one is the loneliest number. One is the loneliest number. You could ever live. Okay. That sounds deep and depressing. It is. Okay. Future's down a tenth. I'm sure Bramo's missing this one, Tom. New yeah, unchanged, yeah. 325.94. From New York, this is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word on Rishika Gupta. President Biden is trying to stoke voter outrage leading up to November's congressional elections. Last night, he called on Americans to reject the politics of Donald Trump and so-called MAGA Republicans. He warned that they threaten, quote, the very foundation of our republic. House Republican leader Kevin McCarthy accused the president of slandering all Republican voters. 
Bloomberg's learned that the group of seven nations are preparing to back a price cap on global purchases of Russian oil. The U.S. hopes that will ease energy market pressures and slash Moscow's overall revenues. G7 finance ministers are expected to formally back the plan today. NASA will try again Saturday to launch its Artemis 1 moon rocket. The space agency tried earlier this week, but the launch was scrubbed because of a problem with one of the rocket's engines and other technical issues. It's the first major flight in NASA's ambitious plan to return to the moon. The mission is carrying test dummies instead of astronauts. You can watch the launch Saturday on Bloomberg TV. Coverage begins 2 p.m. New York time. Shell Chief Executive Ben Van Burden reportedly is preparing to step down next year. According to Reuters, Shell has shortlisted internal candidates to become the next CEO. Van Burden became CEO in 2014 and steered Shell through some of its most turbulent times. And Starbucks has named Reckitt Benkaiser Chief Executive Lakshman Narasimhan to be its next CEO. He's a veteran of the consumer industry. He'll join Starbucks next month, whilst longtime leader Howard Schultz stays in charge. Narasimhan will fully take over next April amongst Starbucks issues, struggling sales over in China, and a push to unionize workers. Global News 24 hours a day on Bloomberg Quick Take. I'm Rutika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. We do need to get a sense of um, the inflation story and how it evolved, because that ultimately tells us when the Fed is going to get comfortable slowing down. The Fed ultimately, through its action, at a minimum, is going to cause a, um, a mild recession. And the longer this goes, the harder that recession gets. Marvin Lowe there, the senior global macro strategist the State Street Global Markets. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning with Tom Keane. I'm Jonathan Ferro. Together with Anna Rad of London, we've got to catch up with Bramo next Tuesday. Long weekend for her. Well, we are. Long oh, weekend for Bramo. That's good. Using all of Tom's vacation days, and he's very, very unhappy about <clears> it. <throat> Yields yeah. unchanged on a 10-year. Very, very close to 326, 325.75. Euro stronger after a week of choppy dollar strength. Euro dollar 99.98 and crude up two percentage points. Tom, 88.42 as we count you down to payrolls Friday. If you are just tuning in, it was a blowout jobs report a month ago of 528,000. The estimate. The recession right now, people took a cold shower. 298. They did, Tom. I think. They did. Uh, they the did. wise man once you, said you nailed that. that the recession goal took a cold yeah. shot. It's in a range on this one, Tom. 452 at the Yeah, you end. did that tweet yesterday, David John. Kelly. I was surprised at the tweet that you lined mm. up. Thank you for that. I have no 75. idea how many people were up with Sarah House at 375. There's a lot no of people idea. in that ballpark, yeah, yeah, in at around 300K. Yeah. Okay, this is important. What we're going to do is do a victory lap with Anna Wong, who's really made interesting economics over the last six weeks. She is chief U.S. economist at uh, Bloomberg. And uh, doc what Dr. Wong has done here that's so, so important is there's a disinflation crew. Everybody calm down. There's a center tendency that, John, I'm going to call Andrew Hollenhorst at Citigroup. And then there are people that say, no, they're going to have to do a lot more. Anna Wong is in that group. You haven't budged, Anna, have you? No, I haven't. I mean, I, I still believe, like anyone does, that inflation is going to come down to below 5% next year. But I just think it's going to stay and linger around 4-ish for, for a while. Well, before. does the strategy that works here have to radically change at 4? I quoted Rudy, Rudy Dornbush, Stan Fisher, Stars, and the classic textbook earlier. They would say you got to apply the same thing at 4% that you apply at 8%. Do you agree? Yeah, I, I agree, because 4% is still double the Fed's target of 2%. And un unless we're closer to 2%, I don't think the Fed will ease up. And I, I think the Fed, I mean, ease up meaning like pause hiking. And I, I think that Powell did say <coughs> earlier that he's going to keep doing 25 basis point, even if, you know, we're not at 5, if it's above 2%. Um, I was interested to read, Anna, in your notes uh, around this uh, jobs release today that we have to go back to 1969 to find an unemployment rate as low as the one that we might get today. What will, what will you be watching for in those stats? Yeah, I, so I will not put as much weight on the top line monthly non-farm gains number. I think that as long as we have a, a falling unemployment rate and uh, average hourly earning growth that's at the same pace as last month, then I think there's uh, it, that will tip the 
balance toward a 75 basis point uh, in, in September. So for top line, I think at the minimum, 100K will do it if the other two things I mentioned just now happen as well. So, so, so 100K means we stick with, we go to 75, is that what you're saying? 100K in non-farm, uh, yeah, 100K, and also falling unemployment rate. So, I, I mean, the, fall, the unemployment rate is measured with household survey. So, in the household survey, if you have only 130K increase in, unemploy, uh, in employment and a stagnant labor participation rate, which is what we expect, you are going to see a, a falling unemployment rate uh, to 3.4%. The, 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 the labor, uh, I'm going to get it out here. Three, two, one. Sorry, yeah. Anna. Anna, the labor report today follows a re labor report that was stunning 30 days ago. Why are we getting this so wrong? What, what is the hard part of gaming this right now? I think, so we have as difficulty with any other people, but um, I think one, one reason is that a lot of the news coverage are on layoffs announced by these sectors, which actually comprise of a very small proportion in the total jobs market. Let's say SNAP, right? This, this week, everybody's talking about the 20% layoff is SNAP. But I look at tax services share of labor market, it's only about 1.5%. If I want to be generous and add tech manufacturing in it, it's only about 2% of the jobs market. So certainly we have some industries which overhired in the pandemic who are going to have to lay off some people. I tabulated that to be those industries to be about 10% of the jobs market only. Whereas the rest of the 90%, um, a lot of them have underhired and still have a lot of labor shortage. Well, let me just cut to just a basic question. How can we have a recession, I guess a normal recession, given where the labor economy is right now? It's not in the textbooks, is it? Well, I, you know, unemployment rate could jump nonlinearly. Like when a recession happened, it's like there's a fire and everybody's trying to get okay, out are you of gonna the building. This is important. Are you going to publish this? Are you going to publish a jump condition? Mike McKee's talking to me about 3.4%, Truman and Eisenhower. You're going the other way, and you're going to tell me we're going to see a 100 beep or 150 beep jump condition in the, un uh, the unemployment rate? Well, yeah, because you know, just look at 1950s. I, I think in 1953, the unemployment rate was also around 3.4. And then in a couple months later, just all it takes is a couple right. months, and it's 150 bips higher. Uh, so it can change very drastically. I remember that sure. well. Oh, you're you, you're that old? Oh, it's wrong. <laughs> I didn't know. Oh. <laughs> Anna, you're welcome We're back. We're going anytime. down in flames. This is great, Tom. Anna Wong, go this. away. This is perfect. <laughs> Anna Wong, thank you. Tom, are you done? Or do you want to keep digging? No, no, it's fine. You, you sure? Know, I, I just, I, I think up. it's great. Look, John, what we're doing when we invented this is having a lot of different opinions. Wow, are there a lot of different opinions right now? There's a ton, and there's one person who had a <clears> massive <throat> opinion on the yield curve. About a month or so ago, it was Priya Misra of TD. And, Tom, she was looking for, what, negative 40 basis points on twos, tens, and she got it and some. We've backed away from those levels in the last couple of weeks. Well, she got there, and, and what's so important is rarely, uh, John, do you see someone give you the magnitude of the move and the timing of the move. And what was so important of what Ms. Misra did was it was the when of it. And she said, this is coming, and this is coming soon. And it's not that people are laughing at her, but we're like, yeah, okay, great. And so I just tens now, Tom, back to about negative 24. Surprise for me in the last week has been the backup in 10-year yields, getting back to about yes. 325. Yeah. See what Priya's got this to say is about really that. important, folks. The spread is two interest rates, and as John mentions, a lot of this recent movement is singularly the 10-year yield. Priya Mishra is going to catch up with us next. The Global Head of Rate Strategy at TD Securities will do that in around about five minutes' time, live from New York City this morning. Good morning to you all with Tom Keen and Jonathan Farrow, alongside Anna Edwards this morning with Bramo out for a long weekend. She's going to be back on yeah. Tuesday. Futures negative a tenth of 1% on the S&P on the Nasdaq 100, but down about a third of 1%. Just a little lighter, softer, lower negative here. Going into payrolls, Tom, just around the corner. John, yen, 140. I know. 32. Can you get used to this, Tom? Of no. Cable at right 115 and no. yen at 140. I am not used to this. These Euro are numbers of 99.99. Sounds like something on sale in a shop. Yeah. Unreal. It is unreal. From New York, this is Bloomberg.
we're seeing right now is severe dislocations in the labor market, right? We're seeing supply and demand imbalances. Equities generally are reflecting a path of policy tightening. Certainly the Fed could use any help from any front it can get at this point. The Fed ultimately, through its action, at a minimum is going to cause a mild recession. This is going to be a challenging back to school season. It could be a challenging Christmas season. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow and Lisa Abramowitz. This is Payrolls Friday, live from New York City for our audience worldwide. Good morning, good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance, live on TV and radio alongside Tom Keane. I'm Jonathan Farrow, together this morning with Anna Edwards out of London. Bramo's going to be back with us on Tuesday. Futures down just a little bit, off by about a tenth of 1% on the S&P 500. Payrolls 90 minutes away, TK. The estimate, 298,000. I like where our guest is. Priya Mizra is going to be with us here in moments. Must listen for Global Wall Street, and she leads with Wage dynamics matter here, John. I totally agree. The ADP report, all new, spanking new, who knows? Wages, 7% plus off that report. You'll wonder what we're going to see about America's paycheck. The data elsewhere, Tom, has been great or we better than expected. Yeah. Even Standard Chartered and Steve England are the team now looking for 75 basis points in September. They had a pause pencil oh, in interesting. November, Tom. Interesting. They had a it's, pause pencil in November yeah. and they're now looking for 50 basis points there too. It's a big change, Tom, after the Chairman Powell speech of a week ago. <clears throat> it's a movable feast and you know we're going to have a lot of good guests on Carl Riccadonna with BNP Paribas with us as well, John, but I really want to emphasize it's an unusual jobs day because it's an unusual global market. We talked a lot about yields in the last our foreign exchange, John, you mentioned the word, it is unreal. A dollar stronger, euro dollar, yeah. 99 97, euro bouncing back a little bit today. We've got to get used to maybe cable at 115, dollar yen <clears throat> at about 140. I can tell you something that we haven't been able to say for a long, long time. Anna, the global bond market in a bear market. Yeah, haven't been able to say that for a generation, according to uh, the Bloomberg uh, <coughs> Index. And, uh, yeah, so, you, I mean, this is a long time. This, this takes us back. I mean, we've already been back to the 70s and the 60s during this programme. I guess we go back to go back to the 80s on that front then. Go back even further sometimes, Anna, to the 1920s. <laughs> we mentioned, the early three, John, we mentioned Tom Three Dog the Night in the last hour. I Tom's mean, lived on. it all. You've seen it all, TK. We're back to the 70s. But, John, seriously, Mike McKee brought this up earlier. I came in late today. I got in... You know, about, um, I don't know, it was like 5.52, I think, I waltzed in the door. And Mike whispered in my ear, he said, look, if we get an unemployment rate down to 3.4%, how many people out there, John, are still going to call a Truman-Eisenhower unemployment rate not a fully employed America? Well, I just tell don't you get this, it. Tom, if we get something like that, the overwhelming yeah. conclusion will be this Fed has more work to do. And I still don't think we've quite reconciled the two worlds. Yeah, the fair, world of the fair. Federal Reserve with the world yeah. of the White House. The Federal Reserve is trying to get unemployment higher, Tom. It's part of the solution in their mind. They're yeah. comfortable with that idea. Not yeah. materially higher, but something closer to four yeah. before year end. And, Tom, I wonder how that's going to settle out at the White House when we catch well, up with Secretary Walsh a little bit later. That's going to be a thing. Yeah, it's going to be an interesting conversation. And, John, I think to start the data, I would dovetail it off in Asia and an international monetary fund saying, Chairman Powell, hold on. Yen, weaker in decades and decades and decades. 139 is not 140. We trip through to a weaker yen, 140. We're holding on right now in the equity market. From New York City this morning, good morning. Here's the price action. Equity futures down all Almost a tenth of 1% on the S&P 500. Down on the week, a little softer on the session. On the Nasdaq, we're down 30 points. We're down a quarter of 1%. Yields unchanged, 325.37 on a 10-year. Tom talking up the dollar-yen move. Euro-dollar, euro showing some strength for once. 99.99 going into the ECB next week. Euro-dollar seeing a move of positive, a half of 1%. And crude positive, too, up 1.94% on WTI. 88.29. We need to talk about a G7 price cap on Russian crude a little bit later this morning. We'll catch up with Jack. Fitzpatrick for that. We need to get you up to speed on what to look for in this bond market once we get that payrolls report in about 90 minutes. We can do that with Priya Misra, Global Head of Race Strategy at TD Securities, joins us right now. Priya, you've had a wonderful call on the yield curve. Let's start here with the 10-year. The 10-year started to move back out, 325, 326. What are your thoughts on that? 
So I think it's been an interesting move. Some have attributed it to QT, um, the fact that, uh, that the Fed is letting the balance sheet run off. I think we've known about QT. It's been happening for the last couple of months. I actually think this is about global interest rates. The fact that we've had a big move in in, in bonds and in, in gills, you, you name it, the global bond market is repricing higher. I think to a, uh, to the global central bank community that's, uh, that's willing here to risk a recession just to fight inflation. So I think it's much more global. I'm watching the ECB next week. I'm watching the Bank of England. I think that's what's going to drive the long end. But I think the Fed's telling us there's going to be pain. So I actually like owning the long end here. You know, we're, we're thinking that the right. Kenya has sort of capped out around three and a half percent. You got Toronto Dominion Bank of Toronto and Priya, it's real simple, Looney near a 132. And that's not an emerging market. You got EM and chaos. Can Jerome Powell fold in this American labor report and ignore the global economy effect? He's got a domestic mandate. So I think he's going to look at inflation. They are looking at inflation. I think it's public enemy number one. And so those wages today or, or CPI in, in two weeks, I think that's still the number one priority. And, you know, despite what's happening with, with, uh, with the global economy, I think if inflation is high, they, it's, it's much too high and they're going to have to keep uh, you know, raising rates. The terminal rate has moved up. I actually think it looks very fair here, around 4% on the terminal rate. I mean, I think the Fed's going to keep it there for a while and we're all going to wait for them to ease and they're going to hold steady until inflation comes down. But I think the global factors are a little secondary for the Fed right now. Mm. So Priya, that kind of answers my question. I was going to ask you, you're at 50 basis points for September, I think, for the Fed. What would get you to 75? I was going to ask you if it was the international context, if it was an ECB move, would that uh, influence the Fed or make, the, like, make that decision easier for the Fed? But maybe it's more about the CPI print still to come then. I think it is. I think the Fed is telling us it's the totality of data, which tells me that CPI report, which unfortunately is going to show up on blackout, it's today. It's all the data between now and then. But I will say that the market's already largely priced for 75. I mean, we're looking for 50, but I'm not fading the fact that the market's pricing in almost three quarters of a, of, of a chance of 75. I mean, if the number today is strong, we're looking for a strong number. Wages still in that 5% number. And even if inflation comes down, if service inflation remains solid, I think that 75 is a very high chance, but it's largely priced in. But it's going to come down to the U.S., I think, inflation data really for that Fed decision in, in, in September. Priya, you talked about what's priced in and what's not. I get a ton of questions on QT. I'll talk about it later on Bloomberg Real Yield. 1 p.m. Eastern oh, time nice promotion. on Bloomberg Thank TV. You. Please. Priya, can you tell me what QT means for you? How does it work? What does it mean for the bond market? Yields up, yields down. I just don't get it right now. Yeah, it's a tricky one. We don't have that much experience with QT. They just did this once in 2017, 18. I mean, I think um, it's really the total amount of QT that matters. The way QT impacts the economy mm. yeah. is through financial conditions. It tightens financial conditions. It actually moves real rates higher. And real rates right. have responded. So I would argue QT over the next six months to a year is priced in. What we don't know is when the Fed starts to ease, well, when they do, we do think they're going to be easing you know, next year. It's not so much about just the reaction function. Right. If the economy slows down, you get a non-linear rise in the unemployment rate. They're going to have to cut rates. I would argue they stop QT then. Now, if they say, no, we're actually going to continue with QT, then I think it tightens financial conditions more. It has an impact on interest right. rates. So it's a, it's a non-linearity. Unlike interest rates, I think actually QT matters as it goes on. The longer right. it goes on, it starts to have more of an impact. Impact. It's not a very, but it's it's very less understood, which is why I notice that Fed officials don't really bring up QT because it's happening in the background, but it's a very powerful tool to tighten financial mm -hmm. conditions. Uh, Priya, there's a splash of a bear market in the bond market. I don't buy it. I think the bear market happened a lot more uh, more sooner, I should say, uh, in particularly on a standard deviation basis. But if we get indices, full faith in credit and uh, regular credit and high yield, if they roll over to new price down, yield up, do we get convexity where there's an acceleration, almost a fear there that people start selling off bonds? This is all new. So I think some of that convexity we've seen through bond fund outflows. I mean, people look at their returns and they say, well, I the bonds were supposed to be my diversifier and it's <laughs> been anything but a diversifier. And so they've been getting out of bonds. You know, where I'm worried about convexity for the credit market is if mm -hmm. we actually have a recession. Default risk, I think, is underpriced. I think the interest rate move is 
largely done. Interesting. But if we do have credit spreads widening, that can result in second that, order effects. She's channeling Marty, Marty Fritz. I know, it's but just I, I, brilliant. I, I, the perfect soundbite there, Tom, and you cut into it. I was going to use it later. Priya, okay, can I come well, back let's do it again. Let's, let's Three, it out. two, one. Mike Q, Priya, Priya, do Priya, it again. Tell me about credit and the risks around it of the back of QT and what might happen with defaults too. Right. So, uh, you know, I think there's a QT aspect, which is just moving real interest rates higher. I would argue real rates is ultimately what impacts the economy, what impacts financial conditions. And if the Fed is telling you they're willing to tolerate pain, I, they haven't quite defined what pain is. Is it 4% on the unemployment rate? Is it 5%? But if we're heading to 5 and unfortunately, the unemployment rate doesn't ever gradually rise. It, it, it rises much faster. You know, at that point, I think default risk, you have to look at company credits uh, and, you know, the lower uh, credit companies, I think that default risk rises and that's negative for credit spreads. I think there'll be more decompression, which means you have to do your work to figure out what companies to own. I think this, you know, QE help rise or all or, or, or boats, I think that goes away. You have to do, you know, the, 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 the research here around which are the companies that have cash, that have decent earnings, Earnings. But in general, I would say the lower credit sectors, I think those credit spreads can widen and total return can be much more negative. Priya, you're one of the recession. best. It's great to catch up. Thank you. Just Priya superb. Mishra of TV Securities. Always you. appreciate it, Priya. Thank you. High yield <clears throat> spreads, Tom, very close to 500 yeah. basis points again. Just starting to break out yeah. just a little bit more. This is really important, folks. This is why we love people like Priya Misery. She comes out of her wheelhouse, which is full faith in credit sovereign debt. And that was fascinating, John, about the default idea. I couldn't agree more, Tom, yeah. especially when people are so comfortable with this idea that we get a downturn, it'll be short, shallow, yeah. and won't cause much damage. You know, John, I tear up on the summer here. Well, well, we'll come back and talk about this. It's so what important. You, what are you tearing up about? Well, we'll talk. it's like sprinkles of Brexit. We'll talk Spr about sprinkles it Sprinkles of Brexit. You know, is, like is, that, is that a new she's, song? She's bringing back romantic memories there of June when you worked an 18-hour day yeah, and, and I didn't. was over at Brown's yeah, Hotel exactly. having rum baba yeah, with I'm, sprinkles. I'm well aware of that. Yeah, okay. Natty Lovely UBS is going to yeah, join us very shortly in the next hour on this equity market. Futures down about a tenth from New York. <clears throat> this is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Ritika Gupta. President Biden has given a preview of what his campaign message will be in the run-up to November's congressional elections. Last night, he accused Donald Trump and Republicans who back him of endangering democracy. Donald Trump and the MAGA Republicans represent an extremism that threatens the very foundations of our republic. House Republican leader Kevin McCarthy accused the president of slandering all Republican voters. Today's U.S. jobs report could tip the scales towards a third straight jumbo-sized interest rate hike. According to a Bloomberg survey, employers added 298,000 jobs in August and the jobless rate stayed at 3.5 percent. That matches the lowest in five decades. Those figures could be enough to lead the Fed to raise interest rates by another 75 basis points to fight inflation. And Bloomberg's learned that the group of seven nations are preparing to back a price cap on global purchases of Russian oil. The U.S. hopes that will ease energy market pressures and slash Moscow's overall revenues. G7 finance ministers are expected to formally back the plan today. And NASA will try again Saturday to launch its Artemis 1 moon rocket. The space agency tried earlier this week, but the launch was scrubbed because of a problem with one of the rocket's engines the, and other technical issues. It's the first major flight in NASA's ambitious plan to return to the moon. This mission is carrying test dummies instead of astronauts. You can watch the launch Saturday on Bloomberg TV. Coverage begins 2 p.m. New York time. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. MAGA Republicans have made their choice. They embrace anger. They thrive on chaos. While the threat to American democracy is real, I want to say as clearly as we can, we are not powerless in the face of these threats. We are not bystanders in this ongoing attack on democracy. 
That was the President of the United States, an address to the nation yesterday evening, live from New York City this morning. Good morning with Tom Keane. I'm Jonathan Ferro, joined by Anna out of London. We'll catch up with Bramo on Tuesday. We're counting you down to payrolls Friday. That number drops in about one hour and 11 minutes. Equity futures going into it softer, negative, down a tenth of 1% on the S&P on the Nasdaq 100, down around about a quarter of 1%. No drama in the bond market for once. Your 10-year run changed at around 326. What a move high we've seen there. 325.75 right now. Euro showing some strength just about below parity. Euro dollar 99.91 firmer by a half of 1%. Tom, you and I were talking about this after the show yesterday afternoon. The math and reading scores for America's nine-year-olds. Oh, we were. Deeply, deeply yeah. depressing, Tom. And I was just going through the NPR release of this. Their write-up of it this morning, Tom. Reading scores, well, their largest <clears> decrease in 30 years. Math scores, their first decrease in the history of the testing regimen behind the study. Anybody, John, with kids knows how serious this is. Uh, I got an email in April of last year that Afterthought was to a required math course. I called up. I said, is she dumb? And, and they said, no, they're just behind. It's upsetting, and, Tom. And that's a fancy school. There's a lot of people not living large who are this is their they're behind by two years, I would say. I've read a lot of the ways that this has been reported, Tom, and it will often say because of the pandemic. And I think we have to be far more specific than that because of the policy response to the pandemic. And that's something we need to think <clears throat> yeah, about a little bit I, more I, in future years. I, I agree. Certainly on the continuum, there was an initial pandemic issue. But you're right. The policy response was maybe done clumsy. But I just would cut everybody some slack. This was what it is, a major, major medical event. And this is, this is one of the outcomes. The question is forward, how do we help these kids rebound? And that's the big question, Tom, and whether we can get those yeah. schools full of teachers. You were talking about some of the vacancies <clears throat> there as well. well. Yeah, in Boston, Boston Herald just moments ago saying there's 200 slots in Boston empty wow. as they begin uh, the school year. Jet Fitzpatrick can do this. We're going to rip up the script with them now with Bloomberg government. Jack, do the teachers control the Department of Education uh, in Washington? That is the stereotype that is out there. What is the power of teachers in your Washington? It's a significant lobby. Uh, you know, looking back to the height of the, the worst part of the pandemic, uh, this was a, a big debate. And, and yeah, Democrats are definitely responsive to uh, the teachers unions. Um, it's hard to draw a clear line from that to the variety of policies that happened in response to the pandemic. Right. Because if you're trying to answer a question about what is federal education policy, uh, there, there are probably 10,000 different answers that actually come down to local and state and, and uh, uh, that whole interplay. Uh, but the short answer is, yeah, the, the teachers lobby is a significant thing. And uh, especially for Democrats, when the Biden administration came in, uh, they're, they're not going to ignore that. Uh, Jack, there's, there's percolating news this morning which brings me back to the great unknown, Secretary Yellen, who was talking about price caps and their efficacy in this war with Russia. All of a sudden this morning, maybe it's a quiet, sleepy Friday in the summer, we have some form of trial balloon football of where we are going to cap energy products to Russia. What is the, the focal point here for the Biden administration? Uh, the focal point in this news on the G7 meeting coming up, uh, it, you know, it may be difficult to pinpoint a focal point for the Biden administration, for one, because they're, they've been searching and it is seemingly everybody in Washington has been searching for what are the further opportunities to put pressure on the, the Russian government and, and limit money going to the Russian government. Uh, but the, the key question from the Biden administration's perspective, at least, is uh, in addition to the logistics, how many people can get on board? Uh, is this, this is going to be a G7 agreement, but can they expand on that with other European right. countries? The EU has <clears throat> some issues. Uh, they've talked to India. That's a big challenge. Uh, it does not seem like they've made a ton of headway on, on getting some formal agreement right. to cap prices with India. Uh, but the question is, OK, what do you what do you do to build on right. uh, a G7 agreement? And that's what the Biden administration would like to they'd like to add something to it. Anna Edwards is if it's a G7 meeting and it's price caps, will the United Kingdom miss Boris Johnson? 
Well, we do have a Prime Minister, but we'll have a new one by Monday and with that possibly new direction. So interesting to see the way, you know, the, the, the machine still functions, I suppose, even in the, uh, even in the absence of, of the new team, the new leadership, which comes in on Monday, Jack, as Jack knows. Uh, so interesting, Jack, if they do find common ground within the G7 on this particular topic, because it seems they are apart when it comes to Iran. And that is something that's been a, a divide across the Atlantic of late. Uh, yeah, the, the, you know, the latest news on that was a, a negative uh, response from the U.S. that said the last communication from Iran regarding uh, the, the nuclear deal and the potential for removing sanctions was not constructive. Uh, meanwhile, you just heard recently from uh, Emmanuel Macron, the French president, that he thought potentially there could be a deal within the next few days on this. Uh, overall, I don't think the U.S. has slammed on the brakes on these talks, but uh, there, there had been some indications that there was a, a possibility of a near-term agreement before the U.S. <laughs> putting out a little bit of a vague statement saying they weren't happy with what they heard from Iran. Uh, it, you know, the, the president was supposed to take a look at this after he got back from his the speech, so we may hear more specifics from the U.S. on what they like uh, or what, what they don't like, but uh, a, a, I guess a pumping of the brakes from the U.S. side on that. How many times can we say we're close to a deal? without being close to a deal. Jack, we've been Good saying question, that for about 12 John. months, haven't we? Good question. We're close to a deal. Yeah, uh, it, it's, it's one thing to hope to be close to a deal, but the number of players in this, uh, I think the, the latest news on the U.S. side indicates uh, it's, it's easy for someone to uh, slow things down. It, the, Always you know, the way. It's not that the U.S. has said that they're, they're, they're not making any progress, mm -hmm. but it, it may be a little unreasonable uh, when you hear Macron say potentially in the next few days. Hey, Jack. Good to catch up. Jack Fitzpatrick there, down in Washington, D.C. TK, do you know who I can hear? I can hear him in the green room. Carl Riccadonna. Oh, my word. He's, BNP he's, he's in the building. He's in, he's the, in building. the building. With research. The brand new chief U.S. economist over at right. BNP. This will be good. So we've this got to catch up with him on thing. payrolls, Tom. And also, since they're a big sponsor of the tennis, ask him why the tickets are so expensive at the, the Open well, this the, year. The, the, you know, that's the only reason we booked them. That's it. Try to get We're going to catch up on just go. that in just a moment. I want to go watch Emma play, and I guess that's not going to work out. Future's down, two tenths. She's out, Tom. She lost. Well, she did. I didn't notice. <laughs> you were right I was so far up in the stands, I couldn't tell. Switched on ESPN the other night, and Murata Kanu's playing first round. Who's there in a bow tie and a beige suit? Courtside. Doesn't tell me. Goes alone. TK, I'm still bitter about it. You went to the tennis and didn't tell me. I was to bitter find about out, it too. I had to find out on TV. Yeah, and I you're got, never going to tell me either, were you? I got nothing from Miss Raducanu. She ignored didn't me the entire hi. time. Didn't even say hi. Didn't even say hi. You know, she lost and didn't even say hello to you. Yeah, at well, the end. she's hurt. You, you know, were like I'm not right gonna, there. Yeah, no, it was it was sad to see. She gave it the college try. Tickets are getting more expensive, Tom. They're like ten thousand. If, you if you're not with BNP Paribas, they're it like ten thousand a seat. Ridiculous. Seen. That's why we've got BNP Paribas in the studio yeah, to find out what's no going reason. on with the U.S. Open tickets. Suspect. Stay tuned for that. Futures down about a tenth of one percent on the S&P. We're down about a third of one percent on the Nasdaq. Softer on the session, down on the week as well. So a little bit lighter here over the last week or so since Chairman Powell spoke, and every single day since then coming into Friday, the two-year yield has been higher. Let's check out two tens and thirties now. Two-year yield comes in a couple of basis points to break that streak, 347.58, but we did take out 350. That's really disrupted the equity market in a major way. The 10-year backing up through 325 briefly, back to 324, going into payrolls about an hour from now, <coughs> looking for about 300K, and every single data point this week, claims are lower than expected. ISM manufacturing, decent. Consumer confidence, firmer. All concluding the same thing. Pretty much every single economist that this Fed has more work to do, just based on the communication we've had from the Federal Reserve. <clears throat> so that's the story for the bond market in America. We've got to talk about the bond market in Europe too. Priya Misra connecting the two, saying that what's happening in the US is also reflecting what's happening in Europe. Yields have been pushing higher, Tom, and that's taken a euro back to about 99.89. Euro dollar firmer by about four tenths this morning, but <clears> through much of this week, in and around yeah. parity. Bloomberg dollar index over 1,300. It's not down 10,000, but but there's a, there's a seismic change in FX, John. City, Tom, looking for 75 at the meeting next week from the ECB, yeah. and maybe even 75 again from the ECB. So right. some big calls out there for the European Central Bank. Well, we'll have to see. You know, I, I, again, we see off the jobs report here in one hour. We will.
We will. Are you done? Any more? I'm done. To say? No, right, cool. Let's, let's okay, let's get you some stock movers. We can do that with the wonderful Kriti Gupta. Hey, Kriti. Uh, good morning, John. Let's talk about that chip story because we did actually get some earnings after the bell. Broadcom coming out and saying that chip story that you are starting to see, the decelerating demand, well, it's not affecting them. Their infrastructure spending is still high. So you see that chip demand story. So Broadcom shares up about 2%. A <laughs> sentiment that is not being reflected in NVIDIA or advanced micro devices. NVIDIA down 7 tenths on day. AMD unchanged. We'll see if that price action goes throughout the day. We have another earnings story, though. Lululemon actually coming out and saying, well, the higher income shoppers, well, they're the ones that keep are keeping the company afloat. Lulu shares up about 9.6%. Once again, it's that retail story that, yes, there is inflation. Yes, there are retail inventory buildup. But once again, the higher income shopper rescuing that company. Moderna, about unchanged as well, was higher earlier in the session, thanks to those Omicron boosters, which are now hitting clinics across the country. So perhaps helping Moderna's bottom line. And then, uh, Tom, the last, of course, ritual check of Bed Bath & Beyond shares. They are down well, about you. 6%. The turnaround plan? Still not impressing investors. Critty, thanks so much. Bed Bath & Beyond, I believe that's one of those meme stocks. This is a joy, and it's a joy for me personally because aerospace engineering matters. If you do aerospace engineering, you are denominator-based looking at the change in time. That's been the hallmark of Rick Adana Economics for years as a young lad at Deutsche Bank in massive service to Bloomberg over the years, and we are thrilled that he has the best seats at the U.S. Open with BMP Paribas, <laughs> the chief U.S. Us economist joins us uh, this morning. Thank you so much for the tickets uh, last week. It was just really, really uh, wonderful. <laughs> Carl, let's cut to the chase. This is a serious moment. You lead where I am with the wage dynamic deserves study today. What will we see about wages in America? I, I don't think we're going to see a significant change in trend here. We have to be cognizant that uh, wages, like all prices, uh, tend to be lagging indicators of uh, real activity. And so uh, we're going to have to see that downshift in the pace of hiring uh, before we see any right. material relief on the wage front. That said, uh, even if we look at uh, whether it's average hourly earnings or non-supervisory and production workers' hourly earnings, uh, we can see that a high watermark has been put in place and, and there's a very modest deceleration right. happening. Now, you're not going to see much if the, the trend is you know, 500,000 uh, jobs uh, per month, which has been the average uh, year-to-date right. approximately. Uh, but if we get a, a slowdown into the fall, which is my belief, uh, then you will start to okay. see more relief. Let's go to the x-axis, which you know, I mentioned the DT and in, in, in your, your, your engineering background. Let's Let's go to the x-axis. This report this morning, how does it change the timeline for the Fed as they make choices? Does September become less important than November meeting, et cetera? Well, I, you know, we're in the end game here for the Fed, I believe. And, and the Fed is, you know, looking for reasons to downshift from these jumbo 75 bit does the uh, market heights. price that in right now that's a really important uh, the, the, for me. the market is trying to uh, see that downshift uh, coming about over the course of the fall and it is priced into some degree the question is whether that can happen in September or not uh, ironically if we look at the inflation numbers uh, they're giving the Fed <laughs> some space to start moving toward that downshift uh, but as uh, chair Powell highlighted at Jackson Hole uh, the labor market is not giving them that space and I suspect we're not going to get that room in today's report uh, a a as well because we're right. still in a hot streak for jobs. John, why in God's name was Rick Adana not at Jackson Hole? we got to fix that I next agree. Time. we got to make that happen. Yeah. Carl, great to see you in a new seat. Thank you, sure sir. Thing. And thank you for being with us. Carl, what's more important here? This idea that we get evidence of an economy that warrants a downshift in Fed hikes from 75 to 50, maybe back to 25, or the fact that the chairman is talking about the pain that we're going to see in this economy and the need to stay where we are, to hold rates and not prematurely loosen. So we could be facing, what, 3.5%, 4% Fed funds through the whole of next year. Isn't that the more important theme here? I, I think that is the more important theme, John. And, and this was something the markets weren't getting despite uh, speech after speech and comment after comment from Fed officials uh, that that was going to be the case. So I really think that the, the main mission for uh, Chair Powell at Jackson Hole, and right, his speech was four and a half pages compared to 13 pages in the uh, prior year, uh, he said, at the onset of the speech, I'm going to be short and direct. Uh, we've got a big inflation job to uh, tackle here, uh, and this is going to require us uh, parking the Fed funds rate in restrictive territory and leaving it there for an extended period, period recession or not. And, and 
when he says some pain for households and businesses, I don't believe that that is code language for a recession. I think mm. he's uh, he's trying something a little different uh, in this cycle, uh, which is not uh, just pushing us into recession to deal with the inflation problem, uh, but rather pushing us into an extended period of below trend economic growth, which will generate slack uh, and ultimately allow the Fed to uh, fine tune the situation. It could be recession, but even a re in a recession, inflation, a lagging indicator, is going to be too high. And so the Fed is going to have to keep its foot on the brake pedal. That was the core messaging from Jackson Hole. There will not be rate cuts in uh, 2023. OK, and how much of a lagging indicator are jobs, Carl? How much do we need to keep that in mind as we look for the data point today? Ordinarily, jobs are uh, relatively a concurrent economic indicator. There's not a big lag. Uh, but what's happening ironically here is this huge, uh, what I call a productivity whipsaw, right? Very early on in the recovery from the pandemic, GDP returned back to pre-pandemic levels. Only as of last month, the labor market finally notched a full recovery. That meant there was a Big expansion in GDP, uh, not as much expansion in the labor market, uh, and so that is a, a big surge in productivity. Well, productivity is mean reverting, uh, and so we've gone back into the, the other side of the mean uh, over the last couple of quarters, which means, meant we didn't get a lot of GDP growth. In fact, it was negative in the first half of the year uh, when we saw massive job gains. Now, that productivity trend is finally reverting back to the mean, which means uh, that the pace of hiring will track more consistently uh, with, with the pace of growth. That was not the case in the first half of the year, uh, but gravity will reassert itself uh, as we go deeper into the back half. I don't think in today's report, because everything's still looking very hot, so I think we could see an above consensus uh, uh, outcome in today's data. But as we're yeah. heading from, remember last year at this time, the, the GDP report in hand was saying 12% real GDP growth. Uh, as we get to the end of the year, it's going to start to look like something closer to zero or somewhere between zero and one percent. Uh, that kind of massive deceleration in the economy will take a, a very yeah. clear toll on hiring, uh, but it's going to take a few more months for that to become apparent. And talking of mean reversion then, Carl, I mean, you seem pretty convinced that Fed officials are not comfortable with where they are with these jumbo hikes and they want to get to, to places they recognise and, and to do smaller hikes. What makes you so sure? Because of all of the language that you talked about at Jackson Hole, which was of such a hawkish nature, what makes you think that they feel uncomfortable where they are now? I think uh, I, I don't think they're uncomfortable uh, with where they are now. I think they realize there's more work to be done. That was a clear message from Jackson Hole, and I think that's entirely consistent uh, with what it's going to take to iron some of the inflation pressures uh, out of the economy. Jackson Hole was hawkish in the construct or in the sense uh, that they needed to push uh, market expectations of rate cuts in 2023 uh, out of the picture, and the Fed largely accomplished that. Uh, I think you know, in a short speech where he wanted to be very clear about uh, his ability objectives. Uh, there wasn't room for the nuance of talking about a downshift. He, there was one line in the speech that made a reference to a, a downshift being uh, 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 likely and appropriate at some point in the future, but he wasn't necessarily saying this is coming up at the next meeting. Uh, we need to see some improvement on the inflation and, uh, and, and labor indicators before that can come about. Uh, but that was a major theme in the discussions at the July FOMC, uh, and we can see that in the minutes as they talk about policy lags and, and most of the medicine that the Fed has administered, has not yet been felt in the economy. Uh, so policymakers are very sensitive that there's a lot of tightening in train. Uh, and if they ignore that lagged effect of monetary policy tightening, uh, then they will risk overdoing it. So they know there's more work to be done. But as you get closer to the landing, you do need to downshift or you're making the classic Fed mistake of, of murdering the economic cycle. So, Carl, that's Jackson Hole down with. Let's deal with Arthur Ashe. Do you want to tell us now why the ticket is so expensive this year? Well, we can see a, a lot of service sector inflation, right? This is post-pandemic spending, the summer of services. People are pivoting from things that can be shipped to your house in an Amazon box uh, to experiences, whether it's air travel or, or Broadway shows or sporting events, concerts. Uh, there's a real shift in spending, and, and that's John. keeping the economy alive and sending a false signal if you're watching uh, those uh, traditional John. retail John. goods metrics. I of mean, activity. John, two seats, men's semifinals, you and me, 23,000. Are you kidding me? Tom, 23,000. 302. Next I mean, weekend. Tom, for that, no we could, recession fly, in those data we could points. fly first class to Milan and we could go and watch the Formula One at Monza. How about Indian instead. Wells in and March? We could watch the Milan Derby this weekend. Dar we and could. fly in first class and, and it would be cheaper than that. I, I do not understand it. I, I don't get it.
BMP Paribas for? I, I blame BMP for this as well. It's Cara Cadonna. <laughs> You notice, Tom, that you, to get in that studio with you, you have to quit your job and then get a job That's at a what bank you have to do. Then, and then you can... Really, I'm still John? I didn't know. It's ridiculous. Oh, my word. Farrell <laughs> Henry. It is ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> Future's unchanged on the S&P. Carl, wonderful to see you, buddy. Sure Just fantastic. Thing. Thank you, mate. From New York, this is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word on Rishika Gupta. President Biden is trying to stoke voter outrage leading up to November's congressional elections. Last night, he called on Americans to reject the politics of Donald Trump and so-called MAGA Republicans. He warned that they threaten, quote, the very foundation of our republic. House Republican leader Kevin McCarthy accused the president of slandering all Republican voters. The U.S. called Iran's response to the latest effort to revive the 2015 nuclear accord not constructive. That raises questions whether the two sides can reach a deal that would free up Iranian oil for global markets. U.S. officials are still looking at Iran's response, which was submitted through the European Union. And Starbucks has named Reckitt Benkiser chief executive Lakshman Narasimhan to be its next CEO. He's a veteran of the consumer industry. He'll join Starbucks next month, whilst longtime leader Howard Schultz stays in charge. Narasimhan will fully take over next April. Amongst Starbucks issues, struggling sales over in China and a push to unionize workers. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. We think we still go meaningfully higher. So let's call that DXY at, at, at 115. It's the bear market in stocks and the bear market in bonds. And that means the dollar is effectively the only safe uh, haven left standing. Ibrahim Rakbari, the global head of FX analysis over at City, going into payrolls Friday. Payrolls about 42 minutes away. From New York City, good morning with Tom Keane. I'm Jonathan Farrow, together with Anna Edwards out of London. Bramo's going to be back with us early next week. Features unchanged on the S&P. Treading water here on the Nasdaq. We're down a little more than a tenth of 1%. Yields unchanged on a 10-year. Let's call it 325 at 324.99. Euro dollar. Euro shown some strength. Euro dollar 99.91. We're positive a half of 1%. The yen showing and some weakness, TK, very briefly coming <clears throat> very right. close to a high of the session of 140.50. That high of the session yeah. now is 140.49 and just backing away just a touch in the last couple of minutes. It's jobs day and we're really focused on the American labor economy, but this is unusual and is of ginormous historical moment. This easily goes back to an ugly August of 1998. And frankly, John, I would take this back to the reformation of Japan after World War II. We get wisdom here on the failed monetary experiment and fiscal experiment of Japan with Jeremy Stretch, head of G10FX at CIBC of Canada, and, of course, Mr. Stretch in uh, London. Jeremy, we, I don't want to make this a history lesson, but there's a point where everyone has said to me over 10, 15 years, Japan unravels. Through 140 up to an unimaginable 150, are we at the point of the unraveling of their economic experiment? Uh, well, it's good to be with you, Tom, and, and it's it's right that we do need to think about uh, parallels with history because, as you correctly say, we're back to levels that we haven't seen since 1998. Uh, and in a sense, we are seeing this Japanese economic experiment really being tested and tested quite aggressively because, of course, we're in a world where we're talking about, and as you were previously just talking about in your last section uh, segment regarding about the policy tightening that we're expecting in the U.S., but, of course, Japan remains in a totally different monetary orbit. We continue to see Kuroda, who, of course, is uh, getting towards the end of his tenure at the BOJ, maintaining that uh, very expansive monetary policy stance. And I think it's interesting that, obviously, we had uh, Finance Minister Suzuki talking overnight regarding vigilance uh, and suggesting or at least uh, implicitly hinting uh, indirectly that perhaps there could be measures to try and stem the slide of the, uh, of the yen. But it doesn't seem as though the market is taking any great notice or any great credence 
And as we continue to see uh, the market reflecting the uh, reduction in uh, U.S. dollar liquidity as we move towards uh, a more exaggerated uh, level of uh, U.S. QT, the path of least resistance seems to be dollar yen higher. Uh, and I guess the question is how tolerant are the Japanese going to be? And of course, now that we're through 140, then uh, well, we're going to find that uh, discussion of 150 is going to become ever more important. If that's the case, Jeremy, do you think that that's the buy point for this BOJ to start leaning the other way. The big surprise from last week, and maybe I'm being a little loose with my words to call it a surprise, but if you go through all the commentary of all the central banks, the S&B, the ECB, the Bank of England, the Federal Reserve, all over the last week, all on the same page, we've got to do more. Then the BOJ saying we need to keep this easy path for monetary policy. Is there a point in foreign exchange where, Jeremy, things snap the other way? Well, you're absolutely right that the BOJ is uh, standing very, very much in splendid isolation in terms of its policy remit. So the question is, how much of the or how far can the elastic stretch in terms of doing it before it does start to snap back? And in a sense, that's the classic uh, debate about where is or sh where should there be a line in the sand? Now, obviously, markets like uh, nothing more than uh, big round numbers. The fact that we've gone through 140 uh, with what appears to be relative impunity takes away one uh, obvious uh, significant level. So we will, as I say, inevitably start to discuss uh, and monitor and consider the risks of uh, moving out towards 150. Now, the BOJ are still talking about the durability of uh, inflationary pressures, and we need to see wage growth picking up in Japan. And until we see that, then it does still feel as though the BOJ in this, as I say, end stages of the Kuroda governorship of the BOJ, are going to continue to tolerate that cheaper yen, and the market will continue to press uh, the resolve of that uh, BOJ policy as we uh, move ever, ever towards that uh, 150 threshold. Jeremy, you took us back to 1998, a time where we saw joint action to prop up the yen. What about uh, policymakers coming together to, to rethink dollar strength? Uh, periodically, we return to this theme. We ask questions about whether we will see some sort of coordination. Do you see levels of dollar strength that justify that yet? No, I don't think I, I don't think I do necessarily. I mean, clearly, I was I was interested by that uh, comment uh, just coming out of the break regarding the bear market uh, scenarios in bonds and equities, which leaves the dollar as the last uh, safe haven standing. And I think there is an element of that. Uh, but I think we can and will see uh, the dollar index probably continuing to make uh, further gains. So that uh, 110 threshold that we got very close to testing yesterday, I think, will uh, give way if we do see further resilience in terms of the data backdrop. Uh, and we continue to see question marks about the scope of policy tightening in other sense central banks. Um, but I think it, it isn't the case that we're in a scenario where we're getting towards the extremes of uh, dollar moves that would prompt uh, the international community to start, start to discuss means or mechanisms uh, to try and stem that. And I think, in a sense, we're also still in an environment where there is a lack of international cohesion, which would be uh, necessary to actually warrant those sort of discussions really taking place on any meaningful basis. And that's the problem, Jeremy. I don't think many people have thrown around the word panic over the last week. I don't think there's been much sign of panic. I do wonder how uncomfortable the Bank of England will be, though, with seeing cable sterling drop to a 114 handle briefly just yesterday, Jeremy. What do you think they're thinking about that? Well, I think of all of the central banks, the uh, Bank of England are probably the one that's in the greatest bind overall because, of course, uh, as we know from some of those more extreme inflation forecasts that we've seen banded around, there is a much uh, more protracted and uh, uh, long-lasting inflation problem in the UK, and the uh, peak in inflation is going to be both later and substantially higher than in most other markets. But the bank are going to find it increasingly difficult to match that sort of inflationary construct because of the weakness that we're going to see on the macro story, because clearly the US, uh, sorry, the UK consumer is under significant and will be under significant degrees of stress, and also the business sector, unless there will be some uh, profound measures of support from the new uh, incoming government to try and alleviate some of those energy price concerns. So I think the path to release resistance is probably still towards sterling weakness, which only source, seeks to amplify some of those inflationary pressures. And that, uh, as I say, leaves the Bank of England in a bind, and not least of which because, of course, the incoming administration, if we're assuming that Liz Truss will be named as prime minister early next week, has been quite critical of the Bank of England's reaction function. So I think from an international investor standpoint, looking at uh, a potential uh, divergence between the policymakers at the Bank of England and or potentially the uh, backdrop of the government, I think that just amplifies the uh, concerns that sterling probably only has uh, a, a route lower. Uh, and if we're talking about uh, levels from 1998 against dollar yen, uh, then I think we may have to go back to 1985 and uh, uh, perhaps levels in, in terms of towards 110 in terms of cable uh, as a as next line wow. of uh, a, a next line of focus. Jeremy Stretch of CIBC. Jeremy, some massive numbers to think about there. Some 110 on sterling. I guess two months ago might have sounded like wow, but now 
after we had a little look at 114 <laughs> yesterday and we're at 115.64 well, at the moment, maybe not such a big call anymore. It becomes the word suddenly, and there's a lot of suddenly going on in foreign exchange right now. John Damien Sassar was of immense value yesterday. And he always go, is. We go into this weekend with the IMF in full operational mode on EM analysis of crisis. I mean, there's no other way to phrase it. We're in full operational mode for Payrolls Friday, Tom. The number in about 34 minutes. We're going to catch yeah. up with Jeff Rosenberg of Black Great lineup. after the number drops. Looking forward to that. From New York, this is Bloomberg. Welcome back to another special U.S. Open update for Bloomberg TV and radio. From Tennis Channel, I'm Erin Coscarelli. The Williams sisters starred under the lights one last time on day four in New York. Venus and Serena hadn't played together at the major since the 2018 French Open, but sadly, it wasn't a winning return. The Americans went down to the Czechs, Lucy Hradecka and Linda Naskova in straight sets. The sisters won 14 Grand Slam titles during their legendary careers. Elsewhere, world number one, Iga Swiatek moved on with a dominating display against 2017 champ Sloan Stevens. The two-time winner at Roland Garros dropped just five games to book her spot in the last 32 for the third straight year. And don't forget, Tennis Channel Live at the U.S. Open hits the air daily at 9 a.m. Eastern. I'm Erin Coscarelli. Right now, what we're seeing is extremely solid job growth. What we've been hit time and again is with this surprising resilience. You're going to need to see very low growth and or negative numbers to kind of get the Fed where it wants to be. We think we're going to see a recession early 2023 in the U.S., but it's happening earlier and deeper in Europe. It is hard to argue that the fear of recession will stop the central banks. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keane, Jonathan Farrell, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Bramowitz, and Tom Keane. Bloomberg Surveillance on Jobs Day. Anna Edwards in for Lisa Abramowitz. And it's real simple, John. I'm going to go against the gloom. Think optimism. Could we see an unemployment rate that takes us back to Harry Truman and Dwight David Eisenhower? The data so far this week, Tom, has gone against the gloom. I said manufacturing was better than expected. Jobless claims yesterday lower than expected. Consumer confidence earlier this week firmer than expected. And last month... Let's not forget last month, Tom. 528,000. Yeah. Where did that come from? The estimate today, 298. Some chief economist said it was like a cold shower on those with a recession uh, group. We'll have to see what we see this morning. I'm going to go with Carl Riccadonna of BMP Paribas, John, and make clear he's going to study wages, so too I, after what we saw with the new ADP report. I'm going to go with the range, Tom. The high, 452. <clears throat> yeah. The low, 75. That's been the defining point of this pandemic through the whole pandemic tom over the last two and a bit years every time we've had payrolls friday the range you can get a london bus through it tom it's been that wide every single first friday of the month and it's no different today we're still struggling to read this economy tom i think that's fair to say there's very little consensus on how big this number will be today with the inflation in london the london bus is going to have a price up 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 anna edwards joins us from london this morning they look to a new prime minister announced monday morning and uh, how does london the united kingdom how do they perceive this buoyancy in the in united states well, certainly buoyancy in the in the uh, in the labour market. We'll get more details on just how buoyant and whether we're getting any pain. And it's a sort of a lack of buoyancy that the Fed wants to see, and that's going to be our yeah. focus. I suppose from the UK perspective, there are similarities and there are differences. We also have that tight labour market, but that's for that's for other reasons uh, as well as similar ones to do with low participation. I mean, John, I look at it as we set up here. We've got a great set of guests here. We're going to start with equity because the stock market does uh, matter. But John, you really wonder: is it about this this report? report in September, or do we stagger the moment this report's out to that next Fed meeting of November? Tom, Diane Swank of KPMG, I think, put it really well. And on Twitter earlier this week, she said it's not about September, it's so much bigger than that. The chairman's given you the playbook last Friday. It's up to you whether you believe him or not. But this is what he's telling you, that we could see some pain in this economy, right. and we're going to remain keeping rates in restrictive territory, Tom, for an extended period of time. And persistence is the bud word now. Not just raise and hold, but persistence. You stay there and you do not loosen prematurely. And every single Fed official that's spoken, Tom, over the last week, and they have done repeatedly, 
they're on the same page. I'm going to go on the data to the real yield. John Farrow had to blow up the real yield. You'll see it this afternoon and through the weekend. The 10-year real yield, John, is stunning. It is leaped, jump condition up to 0 0.80, a positive statistic. That has come far from the negative gloom of quarters ago. Getting back towards levels that we haven't seen since maybe late 2018 when it really started to rock this credit market the last time the Fed was tightening, Tom, and maybe that's the parallel, except this time a lot of people don't think this Fed's going to back away. So how much trouble is in store in the credit market? Yields on a 10-year in Treasuries unchanged at 325.56. Euro stronger, yen weaker. We talked about that a little bit earlier. Euro dollar 99.94. And crude, Tom, 88.13. Nadia Lovell and UBS, that team over there, Tom, they're looking for 125 on Brent crude. That's year part end. Of, well, that's part yeah, of the... 23, 23 yeah. target as well, 125. So that's interesting. That's right where I wanted to go, John. It's like John and I were rehearsed for this, which we never are. Nadia Lovell joins us now, senior U.S. equity strategist at UBS. And just like John was channeling Nadia, I like how you have the courage to take your equity and economic and commodity study out to mid-2023. What does the stock market look like in June of next year? You know, we're looking for about 4,200 on the S&P 500 next year. A lot of what is going to drive where the market goes, as we all know, is where monetary policy goes. And we've heard from the Fed that we are likely to be higher and tighter for longer. So to us, that means like a more range bound market for longer. So we're seeing modest upside from here towards 4,200. We still think those earnings estimates for 2023 needs to come down. Right now, the consensus numbers is much higher than ours. We're about 4% below the consensus numbers. And we think that the consensus is going to come towards us. And even our 2023 uh, EPS numbers is at risk, all dependent on where ultimately that terminal rate goes. And Nadia, how mechanically challenged is the S&P 500, given the weightings, if you think the Federal Reserve is going to be higher and tighter for longer? I think it's a challenging environment for equities. That's why we have been positioning more defensively right now. I mean, we recently upgraded consumer staples as a result of that. That is being joining our other defensive play, which is healthcare, and being offset with a barbell approach on terms of our performance for, for equities. And the reason why we've been positioning more defensively is because we do expect that the economy to slow. I think we can all agree with that. The magnitude of the slow is what is going to be debated. But consumer staples tend to be more resilient in an economic slowdown. There's a strong inverse relationship between its relative performance and the changes in the ISM manufacturing index, which yesterday was strong, but we do expect it to decline and even contract as we head into 2023. We've also seen a pullback, of course, in agricultural and commodity prices. And so that should help alleviate some of the pressures that consumer staples have been seeing. So we expect a more resilient earnings environment for consumer staples versus other areas of the market. And so we're, we're positioned even more defensively headed into 2020. JP Morgan has been super constructive in a way that UBS hasn't. And through much of this year, so far they've been wrong, but we've still got some time left for this year to see if they'll be right. One spot that they do like, and they have been right on that, is the energy sector. Marko Klanovic and the team put out this note yesterday evening. The energy sector remains in a particularly sweet spot. Nadia, I guess my question to you, after what you just said about staples, do you agree with that? And what's the correlation between, say, the energy sector and the ISM, if we're expecting the ISM to roll over in the coming months? Yeah, we, we do agree that, you know, energy still remains favorable. I mean, we've been seeing that for two years now. And each time we've seen energy pull back, we've been recommending buying that dip. And that's worked. And we think that strategy will continue to work. I mean, even though you might expect the economy to slow, we still think that the supply-demand um, dynamic still favors prices across the energy complex to be higher and stay elevated, especially as we enter the winter months. I mean, we know that Europe is going to have likely an energy crisis. I mean, we have the OPEC meeting on Monday, but we're not expecting much of out, uh, uh, outcome of uh, any changes uh, from OPEC at all. Some of it depends on the potential for Iran nuclear deal. But even in, in that, as you noted earlier, we still expect that, you know, Brent oil prices to get to $125 because of these supply and demand imbalances. And, you know, that should be supportive to the energy equities. And mm. when you look at second quarter earnings, energy was strong.
And you might not be worried about, good to speak to you now, dear, you might not be worried about balance sheets at oil and gas companies if we do see oil back up at $125. But are you worried about balance sheets more generally from an equities perspective? John was talking about how there's increasing concern about credit and whether credit markets are really pricing in recession risk accurately. I wonder, are you looking at dividend cover? Are you looking at strength of balance sheets? Are you looking at the profile of debt repayments? Is that, is that looming large for you? It's something that we continue to monitor. But what I can say is that balance sheet across most companies remain fairly strong. I mean, we've had this low interest rate environments, and that's given companies the opportunity to really push out some of those maturities. We also look at corporate balance sheet. Companies have quite a bit of cash on their balance sheet, whether that be tech companies or healthcare companies, and also, obviously, you know, energy companies now being flushed with cash. So we're less concerned about, you know, um, companies broadly in terms of their balance sheets because we just think that they're better positioned going in to even this economic downturn and a potential recession, which isn't our base case. We don't think that we'll get a recession. Nadia, can we play good news, bad news at 8.30 Eastern? Oh, just, just to wrap things up. I, I guess you knew I'm this was sorry, coming. I'm sorry, Nadia. You knew this was coming. If good news this week was bad news, what's bad news at 8.30 if we get some bad news? Is it good news or bad news? What is it, Nadia? What game are you playing? Well, you know, if, if we get another print like we got for the July number, I think that that is going to be bad news from a Fed standpoint. Nadia, the research piece this week that had the most profound impact on me was Luke Kawa boiling water with lobsters and potatoes. I, I don't agree. Know if you saw that on was Twitter. Awesome. Nadia, what is it like to breathe the same air as Luke Kawa at UBS? <laughs> You know, you know, it's good. Um, they, they love each other, know, Tom. Think... They may well be on different teams, though, TK. It's a big well, bank. Well, yeah, but, you it know. Is, it is a large bank. You know, they, they you know, they, they Nadia know. Lovell of UBS. Nadia, thank you Nadia, so thank much. You. Love the we 2023 look. I think that was great news is bad news, Tom. I think that was I the am, takeaway. I, great news is bad news. You're killing me. I, I just, I, my I head just, just starts. You. You're doing that it just that for me. That was just for you. I mean, you wouldn't do this to Anna Edwards. I'm I mean, not doing it to Anna. It's just, just for you, just, just to wind you up. It's just, it's just to wind you up. You, you, there's so much navel-gazing going on right now. Well, it's, it's John, let's get humble. Friday. Come on. John, 30 days ago in 20 minutes <laughs> was stunning. <laughs> no one was saying 500K was plus. Was stunning. I agree. Was just stunning. I agree. What if we get that kind of number again? Patrick Harker of the Philadelphia Fed told me sat alongside us in Jackson Hole this time last week. And I think he spoke to that humility. This cycle is moving really quickly, Tom. And people I, I, still, I agree with that. I still, think that's very important. two years into this, coming out of that mess <clears throat> back in 2020, yeah. still trying to keep up, still trying to keep up and struggling yeah, to keep up. Goes back to the x-axis. I'm watching yen. We're going to dash to 141 here. Absolutely stunning. Euro dollar, 99.99. Just like saying that. That currency pair, yeah, now at parity, positive a half of 1%. Randy Crowson is going to join us shortly, economics professor at the University of Chicago open. and, of course, former Fed governor. We'll see if he's got any US Open tickets, yeah. TK. Ask him in the break, see what he says. We'll ask him on air too. Payroll's Friday just around the corner. Then we'll catch up with Mr. Rosenberg, Jeff Rosenberg of BlackRock, off the back of that. Futures totally unchanged, as you might expect them to be. Going into payrolls, that number is just 18 or 19 minutes away. Heard on radio, seen on TV. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Rishika Gupta. Less than 20 minutes away from that crucial US jobs report, the numbers for August are expected to show that payrolls expanded by 298,000 and the jobless rate stayed at 3.5%. That would match the lowest in five decades. Those figures could be enough to lead the Fed to raise interest rates by another 75 basis points to fight inflation. President Biden is trying to stoke voter outrage leading up to November's congressional elections. Last night, he called on Americans to reject the politics of Donald Trump and so-called MAGA Republicans. He warned that they threatened, quote, the very foundation of our republic. House Republican leader Kevin McCarthy accused the president of slandering all Republican voters. And Bloomberg's learned that the group of seven nations are preparing to back a price cap on global purchases of Russian oil. The U.S. hopes that will ease energy market pressures and slash Moscow's overall revenues. G7 finance ministers are expected to formally back the plan today. 
NASA will try again Saturday to launch the, Ar the Artemis 1 moon rocket. The space agency tried earlier this week, but the launch was scrubbed because of a problem with one of the rocket's engines and other technical issues. It's the first major flight in NASA's ambitious plan to return to the moon. This mission is carrying test dummies instead of astronauts. You can watch the launch Saturday on Bloomberg TV. Coverage begins 2 p.m. New York time. And Bloomberg's learned that Japan's SoftBank is planning to cut at least 20% of the staff at its Vision Fund operation. The world's biggest tech investor will slash a minimum of 100 positions. Earlier this summer, the Vision Fund posted a record $23 billion loss. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Tape, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. The danger is wages really get behind, and so there needs to be a catch-up, and then there will be a catch-up of prices. So this is a very important time now that the Fed and other central banks as well can address the inflation, so there's less of a need. The workers see less of a need to adjust wages. That was John Taylor, the professor of economics at Stanford University. I always get excited when I see out the corner of my eye Mike McKee making the walk into the studio on a payrolls Friday. That number dropping at about 20, 12 minutes time. I'll get my maths right, Tom. 12 minutes time, not 20, 12, 12 <coughs> minutes away. Mike McKee's going to break that down for you. Jeff Rosenberg of BlackRock's going to break it down too. The number you're looking for, 298,000. The range is just wide, wide, wide. 452 is the high, 75 is the low. You all remember the previous number of about 520. Yeah, I nailed that. Okay. <laughs> I don't think anyone nailed that. Going into yeah. it, Tom, futures unchanged on the S&P, little lighter. Softer, lower, negative two tenths on the Nasdaq 100, yeah. and yields unchanged to it. Let's call it 326 on a 10-year. Let's get right to it right now, and we do that after listening to John Taylor of Stanford University, and of course, all of his great work on really thinking through our monetary process. Randy Krosner is the former governor of the Federal Reserve System, economic professor at the University of Chicago, and someone who's read John Taylor cover to cover. Um, Randy, I understand that you did not dress as a raisin to show microeconomics in freshman economics, as Professor Taylor has done at Stanford. <laughs> But I do want you to, to, to talk here about the efficacy of a rules-based central bank that John Taylor codified with the Taylor rule. How distant is this modern Federal Reserve from being rules-based? Well, I think um, the, uh, the, the Fed has, uh, uh, has articulated a different set of rules, a different approach in their average inflation targeting. And, um, and unfortunately, I think that may have gotten them into a bit of trouble and getting a bit behind the curve, saying since we had been had low inflation for a while, we can wait before trying to respond to inflation rising. Uh, so I think they had um, a form of a rule, but one that just didn't work out so well. Are jobs of Americans part of that new rule? I'm sorry, our jobs? Our jobs in America, jobs, the labor economy, oh, is it sure. part of their set new rule? It certainly is. That's all I get? I mean, just, you know, John, help me here. Governor Cross is giving me... Here. He's giving yeah, me I'm, short I'm questions to, uh, here. No, trying, but, to, trying to give you a short answer. <laughs> no, but Randy, I think this is really important. Where does the new labor economy... We're all observing a boom economy in labor, a fully employed America, an unemployment rate that goes back to Truman and Eisenhower, and we're trying to figure out what the rules of the road are for this central bank. What are they with labor? And so they are certainly, um, uh, they understand that the, uh, the labor market is, uh, is very tight. And um, uh, we have this really unusual circumstance of having so many vacancies relative to the, uh, the number of unemployed people. Um, and of course, that uh, in, uh, in means a super, super tight labor market, lots of wage pressure, just as uh, John Taylor was talking about. And the key thing that the Fed is focusing on is making sure that those uh, wage expectations of, um, uh, that have been very high recently don't continue to stay so high because that's going to make it very difficult to pull inflation down if people continue mm. to demand very high wage increases. 
Ramsey, really good to see you. It's Anna in London. Where do you think the transmission, the assumed transmission mechanism of these higher rates, where could it all fall down? You described there some of the process, so interest rates go higher and they want to weigh down on job vacancies, weigh down on wage demands, weigh down on inflation. Where could that go wrong and not actually happen? Uh, well, it could be that uh, there's this fundamental disequilibrium in the uh, in labor market. Some um, uh, some Fed people have talked about that. That makes it very difficult uh, because we've got so many disruptions. We've got such uh, a big mismatch between what um, what the firms are looking for and the skills that that people have um, that you might not get the normal circumstance of higher uh, higher interest rates sort of leading to uh, higher unemployment. I think we'll get there. I think, you know, monetary policy has impacts with long and variable lags, as Milton Friedman has famously said. They really only started on this path about six months ago, and it's usually six to 18 months that most economists would think that Fed policy has its, uh, its major impact. So by this fall, we should be seeing it. Um, but, you know, uh, mm. obviously the, the market continues to be on fire here as well as in most countries. Right. So, Randy, so from that, by that logic, the jobs print we get today is really only responding to what talk of a Fed hike or the very first Fed hike. Yeah, in some sense, it's, it's the echoes from the past that, uh, that will be coming in. I think that's exactly right, because it's long and variable lags. It doesn't just, you know, the Fed raises rates. It doesn't mean that the, uh, the economy just goes down or that the unemployment rate goes, goes up. It takes a while. Randy, you're going to be sticking with us, I'm happy to say. Randy Kreisner there of the University of Chicago going into payrolls about seven minutes away. Mike McKee in the seat, microphone switched on. Mike McKee, what are you looking for in about seven minutes' time? You know, a lot of the ancillary indicators have suggested that we might get an upside surprise for the month. But uh, one thing to consider is that the Bureau of Labor Statistics has uh, gone back to an older form of their seasonal adjustment. They changed it during the pandemic because the numbers were so wildly out of whack. So there could be a very large seasonal component to this that would subtract a lot of numbers. We'll look for that. Are you looking for a, a revision to that previous month as well? Mike, that 520. Well, yeah, there's pretty much always revisions. And interestingly enough, uh, July is usually revised higher. So uh, <laughs> we could see we could see a bigger number. And one thing to watch for going forward is the, the government's already announced that there uh, is something like 526,000 jobs over the past year uh, that are have not been allocated to various months yet. But the uh, overall employment is about a half a million higher than uh, they originally reported. We'll get those uh, assignments come January, but they've got the preliminary yeah. number out. So we still see a strong labor market. TK, get out the blindfold and get out the dartboard, I guess. It's one of those. Feels that way. It's after Looking um, at the range of estimates. Yeah, and I think that should be considered normal, John. We forget we're at a pandemic. I saw one data point yesterday of deaths going back above 500. Again, not to be inflammatory on that, but th this is so unusual and so, so original versus other cycles. The compare and contrast back in history, I think, is, is, is really risky. Yeah, we're all with you, Tom. To have a range yeah. that wide at 452 versus yeah, 75. we're making it up. I think everyone's making it up. So that's the range. The high is 452, the low is 75. The median estimate is 298,000. You're all familiar with the previous read <clears> at this point. It was 528K. Yeah. And equities, Tom, let's say they're going nowhere going into this jobs number. Yeah, there, yeah, there's been a churn there in the market. The, even the FX market has pulled back a little bit from the excitement of the last hour as well. But I do want to say, John, as we talked to Priya Misra about, the bond market is speaking here. It'll be interesting to where it is in seven minutes after this report's released. Coming into this, the two-year close to 350, the 10-year close to 325. Equities up by about a tenth of 1%. The euro stronger, the yen weaker. Euro dollar 99.97, that currency pair positive a half of 1%. And crude up by about 1.9%. Crude 88.26. The jobs report in America coming up next. Your estimate 298K. The data drops in just a minute. Payrolls in America seconds away, then seconds after that, it's Operation Get to the Beach. From New York City this morning, good morning. Equity futures positive a tenth of 1% on the S&P 500. The Nasdaq basically unchanged with the jobs data. Here's Mike McKee. 
Well, we got a number that's pretty much in line with what Wall Street expected. 315,000 jobs created during the month of August, with uh, 308,000 of those coming in private payrolls. We'll have to look in a moment. Uh, there could be a big seasonal factor with teachers going back to work. So this could be an overall uh, larger number in uh, non-seasonally adjusted sense. Manufacturing payrolls up 22,000. We did see some strength in that ISM report yesterday. Average hourly earnings come in weaker than anticipated, three-tenths of a percent up, which means the average year over year is 5.2 percent unchanged from last month, but lower than the 5.3 that had been expected. Here's an optimistic number for the Federal Reserve. The labor force participation rate rises to 62.4 from 62.1. So a significant number of people going back into the labor force looking for jobs. And that is something the Fed wants to see. Uh, the U6 underemployment rate in, interestingly enough, though, rises to 7 percent from 6.7 percent. And uh, I don't know if I mentioned this. The overall unemployment rate rises to 3.7 percent, and that would be a function of those people going back into the labor force. So let me take a further dive into the numbers here, John. Sure, and do you that. can uh, take a dive into the markets and it's see how we're It's pretty simple, Mike. Yields down, equities up. Yields at the front end down by five basis points to about 345. Equities up six-tenths of 1 percent on the S&P. On the Nasdaq, up six-tenths of 1 percent. Dare I say, Mike McKee, that this might be called a Goldilocks jobs report through much of this morning. Just given what I'm looking at at the moment, you've kind of got an inline payrolls figure. Unemployment's up, but participation is up and wages are just a little bit softer. If the Fed had to design a jobs report this morning, Mike, would it look a little something like this? It probably would. Uh, this is kind of what they're expecting, kind of what they're interested in. Uh, the unemployment rate rises because the number of unemployed people increased by 344,000, but it doesn't appear they lost jobs. It's like people coming back into the labor force who hadn't gotten jobs yet. <laughs> so uh, that's uh, reasonably good news. Uh, the uh, Unemployment rate for adult men and Hispanics rose during the month. The jobless rates for women, teenagers, whites, blacks, and Asians, little change over the month. So basically, it seems to be a number of men coming back into the labor well, force that did not find jobs yet. Critically, dollar gives way. Even the yen gave way after a 140.50 uh, uh, print. John, uh, Mike, I'm looking at this, and the simple math right at the top of the Bloomberg uh, study by Scott Landman and team is 315,000, take away a two month revision of 107 gets you to 208,000 summary of one of the studies, the the, uh, the, the non-farm payrolls survey. Is this sort of, as John said, Goldilocks, is this a back-to-normal report? You could call it that, but we don't really know what normal is these days, because going into the pandemic, we were looking at 150, 180,000 a month or something like that. So at 315, we're still significantly higher. Uh, I might mention John, uh, that Tom talked about the 107 that you subtract for the revisions, and you asked me beforehand. I was wrong. Uh, July was not revised higher. It was revised lower, but only by 2,000 jobs. So most of that revision comes in the month of June. Uh, July comes in at 500. 126,000. So still strength in uh, these months. It will be interesting to see how much the uh, jobs numbers change in the when we get the September report, uh, how much August is revised. Mike McKee, thank you, buddy. Just working through some of these numbers. Mm -hmm. Looking at the market reaction, it's pretty clear. Up 7 tenths on the S&P, on the Nasdaq 100, up 8 tenths of 1%. Yields a little bit lower at the front end, Tom, back to 345. We're down about four basis points on a two-year, taking back some of that Fed angst for the September 21 meeting. And, Tom, something I said moments ago, we'll see if this move sticks, but if you could get the Federal Reserve and equity market balls to agree on something, on what a great jobs report <clears> might look like, if they could design one, Tom, I think this is maybe what they come up with. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I agree with that, and I, and I think it's it, the hourly earnings are way more quiescent than what we saw from ADP uh, a couple days ago as well. And again, an equity lift here. The VIX from a 27 level in the angst of two three days ago comes in nicely to 24. A few moments more with Randall Krosner. He's a former governor of the Federal Reserve System, math from Brown and at Booth School, economics professor at the University of Chicago. Uh, Randy, I, I, I want to talk here about America's labor economy is being a homogenous, where we talk about an all-in, say, 3.7% unemployment rate. 
or is it about the haves doing well and a good part of America flat on their back? Uh, there is a lot of um, diversity in the um, and the labor market outcomes. I think you're exactly right. So this is not something that's even. But as you were describing, this is really what the Fed is hoping for. More people are coming back into the labor market. That helps to uh, to reduce the tightness of that market. And you saw that manifest in slightly lower wage growth, which is exactly what the Fed is hoping for, that more people will come in, re relieve some of the uh, the pressures in the market, and take some of the pressure off uh, some of the wage increases. So that'll make it easier for the Fed to uh, to, to try to bring inflation down to its 2% goal without um, uh, pushing the economy too far, uh, uh, too far down. Mm. Uh, Randy, we've got uh, the participation rate to that point at 62.4% then. How high can the Fed hope and, and wish and will that number to get? Well, they'd like to get a lot higher. Maybe they'll get a little bit higher. I think it's, a, it's surprising how much it, it hopped up. My guess is that um, it may not uh, stay that high or it might come down a little bit, but it's going in the right direction, which is exactly what uh, we, what we want to see, see happening to reduce some of the labor shortages, to reduce some of the, uh, the pressures in the labor market. Because it's been a bit surprising, given how strong the labor market is, that a lot of people haven't been bothering to even look. Randy Krosner, based on some of the takeaways, I think you're going to hear that word Goldilocks a lot this morning. Would you push back against that characterization of this report, given what you're expecting in the months to come? Well, it's just one number, uh, so we wouldn't want to go go too far. But I think it's it's consistent with where, where the Fed wants to go. I think it uh, has made the markets uh, somewhat happy that because uh, I think they were worried that there could have been a blowout report here. And uh, unfortunately, good news in the labor market can be bad news because the Fed will have to respond uh, more. And so I think it's it, it's on a good path. But the Fed is still going to be debating 50 or 75 basis points. Yep. And I think it's going to end up by, you know, very close to four by the end of the year, if not at four, and then be, you know, hold with a four handle uh, through much of 2023. Randy, thank you. Randy Crosen there of the University of Chicago. TK, hard to get excited about one data point, but on one data point, and it needs to be a trend, of course, to get any conviction about the future around this, but this is what I think that equity market bulls and the Fed might design if they wanted to call it a soft landing. Of course, Tom, that one data point doesn't prove a soft landing. You need a whole string of reports going one into yeah. next year to get us excited about anything uh, uh, like that. On the that. joke we've been doing today, John, good, bad, bad, good, whatever sure. it is, what this does is really push away a lot of the arch gloom that was out there. John, on Standard & Poor's futures, just printing 4,000 moments ago, and I want to give the dates here, and there's, there's many dates back, back to July, back to June, then back to May of this year, and then you go back to S&P 4000 of early April of last year as well. That's sort of where that fits into the continuum. So we fade some of the Fed angst into September 21. Tom, yeah. that can change all over again on September 13th with the inflation report. Right. Mike McKee's had a second chance to look through this. Mike, do you want to jump back in quickly? Yeah, uh, one of the interesting things I notice is there are almost no real standout occupations uh, one way or another. There are a few lost jobs, but very few lost jobs in categories and no major hiring. I mean, we saw 18,000 uh, people at restaurants, but uh, that's nowhere near what it used to be. They're still looking for people, though. Uh, but the one area that you do see a drop is in the category of uh, that includes mortgage bankers, mortgage brokers. They're down by 2,400 jobs. And that's also something you would expect because obviously the housing right. industry is in trouble. And so uh, it, this is an overall strong report because it just has a kind of breadth to it, not uh, any uh, one particular category that's carrying it. Whether gloom or optimism, we speak with Jeffrey Rosenberg of BlackRock, their portfolio manager for their systematic multi-strategy fund. We're thrilled he can join us each job day. Jeff, we need to recalibrate into next year. As John Farrell mentions, we need more data but this seems to be one sigh of relief. Equities up. How does the bond market have a sigh of relief? Well, it's a sigh of relief, Tom, because you had a lot of expectations really following the, the Jackson Hole 
uh, presentations, speeches, both by Powell and Schnabel, that were, were very hawkish with regards to central banks, definitively stating that they were focused on inflation. And so the setup going into today was a little bit skewed to the downside, that if it was a stronger report that would have only solidified expectations for the 75 basis points in, in September, and if it was a significantly weak report, then the market might have looked through that as opposed to what we've seen you know, in the last couple of payroll reports, particularly over this summer rally. Uh, it had been a, a market that, hey, if we got bad news, bad news is good news. And it may no longer be the case that bad economic news and slowdown is really going to push the Fed off of its tightening cycle because they've been so clear to tell us it's really about inflation. So I think the look mm. through for today, Tom, is, is really about what does the report signal about any kind of inflation look through. And I think the labor force participation rate number is really the key uh, takeaway that is the most interesting piece, as, as you discussed a minute ago with Randy, which is, you know, a little bit better than expected news there, a little bit weaker than expected on the wage front. You know, modestly, that's good news from the bond market perspective of not having to see the Fed really react to uh, inflation maybe as a strong Again, one data point, we're not going to overread that, but that's the one takeaway I would have from this report that I think is, is important is, is the look through to inflation. OK, so I'll be in danger of overinterpreting one data point then, Jeff. Um, with that participation rate, we've seen Fed swaps showing a pairing of bets on rate increases. Does it make sense then to expect less hiking from the Fed? And in what, in, in what sense? Less hiking in the near term or less hiking overall? Uh, less less hiking next year. What what do we think? Yeah, it's it's definitely about the near term trajectory. I think what you're seeing in the markets today is a, is about you know the 75 versus 50 debate. Today's number you know maybe pushes back a bit, and that's why you're seeing uh, the rally in the front end of, of interest rates. But let's not overinterpret again one data point. Um, this isn't really going to significantly change the trajectory. Uh, of the Fed and the terminal rate debate is is still very much uh, unsettled. And today's yep. labor market uh, report isn't really going to settle that debate. We're going to focus a lot more on the inflation and the inflation trajectory. You know, a minute ago, Mike McKee mentioned the you know some of the housing numbers. Um, you know, this is one of the big challenges here that we're seeing is a, a huge <clears throat> transition from home ownership yeah. uh, to home renting, and and you know that rental. Price is a is a huge component of that inflation uh, outlook. Right. So th those things are not really being addressed here on this labor market report, and that still faces yeah. uh, the market still faces yeah. that uncertainty. And, and, and John Fair, what's so important here, and you brought this up before, it's a key insight: is what do we really learn about where the terminal rate is for the Fed? The answer is this doesn't help us. Well, look, at the end of the day, I think the Fed's been pretty clear. They want tighter kind of financial conditions, and to some degree, that's going to cap the upside over the next few months, Tom, if they're not satisfied. And ultimately, the Fed's in control, and we've said it a million times over the last week. We've gone from a Fed put to a Fed call. The good news, I think, for a lot of people, just for now, if you're bullish this equity market, this is a relief. Will it stick by the end of the day? We'll see. Futures rolling over just a little bit, positive a half of 1%. I'll continue this conversation with Jeff's colleague, Rick Reader. We'll do that at the top of the hour. Looking forward to that conversation. Also catching up with Victoria Fernandez across Mark, Michael Gapin of Bank of America, Jim Bianco of Bianco Research too, and Secretary Walsh of the White House, Tom, all coming up. Secretary Walsh about 9.45 Eastern time. Very good. John Farrell with the Secretary of Labor. We will look for that on radio and television. J J Joining us now, uh, excuse me, Jeff Rosenberg still with us as well. We've got a great team lined up here to get you out over the next 17 minutes of this jobs report. Jeff, what are you seeing in flows? What's the fear level out there? I don't want to know inside BlackRock baseball, but are, are, are people selling bonds? Is money flowing out of debt? Yeah, Tom, as you can imagine, you know, the flows are highly reactive to yeah. the returns. And this has been a historic uh, negative return year for uh, all categories of fixed income. And, and, and we've seen that in the past week as well in terms of acceleration, in terms of rates higher, spreads wider. Uh, this is a very challenging environment for fixed income because we come we came into this year really pricing the old inflationary regime. And, and, and obviously the inflationary regime has surprised the Fed, it surprised the bond market, uh, and, and we continue to see those surprises. And, and so until we get a sufficient 
inflation risk premium priced into the bond market, uh, returns are, are, are going to be challenged. Now, the good news is you're starting to get more of that priced in, more of it priced into the front end of the curve. You talked a minute ago about the terminal rate. It's the back mm -hmm. end of the curve where you, you still see a lot of confidence in the bond market that inflation will fall back right. to the 2% uh, <clears throat> target. And, and so this is, this is a bond market that gives the Fed an incredible amount of credibility. Uh, that remains uh, you know, to be seen, and that's a vulnerability to, right. to future uh, fixed income well, returns. Jeff Rosenberg, thank you so much. Really uh, appreciate the valued time here on Jobs Day before a holiday weekend. Ira Jersey is scheduled to be with us here in a moment, but we wanted to squeeze this in. With all the gloom that's been out there, and certainly with futures up 17, the VIX in a stick, 24.39, maybe a little less gloom than moments ago. But we wanted to talk to someone who has a framework of optimism about the American financial system, the American economy, and yes, stocks higher. Michael Purvis joins us from Talbeck and at Capital, always writing really intelligent notes. Michael, let me cut to the chase. What is the why and the how we get the Standard & Poor's 4,500? Well, Tom, you know, one thing that's been um – Kind of working in the market's favor broadly, you know, putting aside positioning and relief rallies and and so forth, is that you know the corporate earnings machine has been really performing here. Um, now, obviously, there are a lot of questions about how whether that um, trajectory can be maintained into the end of the year and in particular to 2023. Um, but look, you know, nominal GDP is very high. It's the components of nominal GDP in terms of the weightings of inflation versus real growth are not what we want them to be. But we're still seeing, seeing you know, nominal, high nominal GDP drives of nominal earnings, right, there. And so we're, we're, we are seeing, you know, continued strength. If you look at Q2's reports, they came in, the surprise levels were better than they were in Q1 there. Um, and on the other side, on the valuation side, look, you know, we have had, you know, you go through this massive Fed pivot over the last 12 months. It's been pretty remarkable, but it's also really well priced. And, and PE multiples uh, are, and the equity risk premium by, by my uh, measures have really calibrated appropriately here. So look, if we wake up and, you know, next week, the 10 years hit 4%, which, which, which it won't be, but, but, you know, if it were to do that, then obviously we're probably going to see some further PE contraction and so forth there. But I think mm -hmm. right now the markets are, are going along. And so I think, you know, uh, uh, we need to get through this uh, September Fed meeting. We need to get through some, yeah. uh, you know, but, look, okay. economic data is good. Um, uh, the unemployment data, um, you know, is still really robust. <clears throat> the ISM we just got and is, maybe, is And maybe, Michael, what we're seeing here is markets responding or coming around to that view because U.S. 10-year yields, 30-year yields resume their rise. 10-year yields up to 3.27% uh, right now. You talk quite positively about stocks and about the earnings story, but others say... Uh, that the earnings need to catch up with reality, and that means uh, that we need to see cuts to expectations around corporate profits. Why do you not see that? Well, look, I, I think part of this is simply comes back to nominal GDP being being high this year and probably pretty high next year as well. My biggest risk to earnings next year, I mean, of, of course, if we get a big recession, yes, that's going to. There's no question that will be um, a big hit to earnings here, but. Uh, you, you know, the, what are the other real risks for earnings next year? Simply inflation coming down a lot. If that were to happen, a lot of the earnings uh, w will come in, and some companies will certainly see right. some some margin compression there. <laughs> Michael, but, I want to give you, I yeah. want to give you a victory lap, Michael Purvis. We had Priya Mizran earlier with a call of the summer on curve inversion, and every once in a while, Purvis absolutely nails it, folks. A few years ago, Michael. You nailed ADXY, the blended Pacific Rim currency regime, X Japan. We now have uh, yen through a new level moments ago, 140.80 on Japanese yen, many talking 145 weaker yen. Michael Purvis right now on what it means to see such currency weakness and strong dollar on the Pacific Rim. Well, I think it, it, it's it's very significant. I mean, the fact is is that the United States dollar, relative to so many currencies, the euro, but particularly the yen, and 
and many EM currencies is sort of a, a effectively a petro currency, um, certainly on a relative basis here. So, you know, if you're talking about the yen, you have to consider high hydrocarbon vulnerabilities and they're as as painful as oil prices are here it's a lot less so than it is in places like japan and, and the eurozone so i think i think there's there's that you know if you tell me tom that oil is going to 150 i'll you know i i can't imagine how the yen wouldn't get a lot cheaper or the euro uh, mm. get sub substantially cheaper relative to the dollar here so i think that's okay. one of the weird dynamics is that oil is leading <clears throat> is is a key thing that's driving, right. uh, that's leading currencies around by the nose. Uh, and does that lead to a change in BOJ policy, Michael? Is that where this leads? <laughs> well, I guess we've all been waiting for that for some time. I think there's a, you know, there's certainly an interesting um, sort of game of chicken the BOJ has been playing here. We'll see uh, at what level of uh, sensitivity they have. But I think they're, you know, after like, you know, three decades of very, very considered the deflation, disinflation in Japan, you know, maybe that they feel this is what it's sort of needed to kind of wake up um, uh, the economy there. But uh, it, it is a dangerous game. I think they're playing at some point. Uh, Michael Purvis, thank you so much. Greatly pre appreciate it there. A real optimism on the equity market, and we're seeing it right now with futures up 20, Dow futures up 149, the VIX in 24.37. Uh, and this off, a, three, a little higher unemployment rate. Mike, Michael McKee, I want to slip you in here very quickly. One more insight right now, quickly. Uh, the idea that uh, people have come back into the labor force makes a big difference because when you look at the uh, average hourly earnings, uh, June was revised down a little bit. So for three months right. now, we have seen flat or falling uh, hourly earnings. They're still high, but they're coming right. down. So this is a very Fed-friendly report. To get this in with Albert Nardelli, uh, Yuri Kosova, and Michael Nenabauer on G7, backing a price cap plan for Russian oil to limit revenues. How will Europe greet this, Anna Edwards? Mm, this has been something that Europe has not been on the same page as the U.S. on. Certainly Germany had their doubts. They wanted Turkey and India to be part of this. So to Jack Fitzpatrick's point earlier on, uh, the European right. response might, might rely on how the rest of the right. world responds. Uh, let's go to Ira Jersey right now. We're jumping around here in stores, and I really want to leave some time for Anna Edwards on the politics of London uh, this weekend. Ira Jersey on the bond market. John Farrell was talking about this is the report the Fed wanted to see. Do you agree? I think generally, uh, generally yes. So the the idea is is that the uh, wages are slowing, the job market though is still okay. So this is you know maybe leading us toward a soft landing. But but of course it is only one report. Um, I, I think the market is certainly taking it a little bit as a Goldilocks report, where um, you know you've had uh, at least the knee jerk reaction has been for people to buy the front end a little bit and sell the long end. So you, you do have some uh, a little bit of curve steepening right now and and signaling that maybe we're we're not going to have as hard of a landing as the market was pricing just before the report. I, yeah, Ira, and, and maybe not as much hiking. Is that the conclusion? I note that uh, one piece of research drops into my inbox, says 75 basis points is still on the table. You think so? Yeah, I think 75 is still on the table. You know, it, the inflation report, I, I know you had Jeff Rosenberg on a little bit earlier, and, and he mentioned, look, inflation is really what the Fed's trying to fight here, that this is one component, and obviously an important component, winds up being wages and the health of the, the overall economy. Um, but but the, the inflation report will be in incredibly important for whether or not the Fed goes 50 or 75. To, to my thinking, though, this doesn't necessarily change where the terminal rate's going to be. So how far will the Fed go? Because even if they go 50 uh, in in September, um, you know, we don't know what they're necessarily going to do in November or December, right? So if they go 50 each of those, then then obviously we're going to price for higher terminal rate. And we were just about starting to price for terminal the terminal rate to be above 4%. Um, and uh, and we backed off just a little bit from that this morning. Um, but we're still hmm. talking about another 100 to 150 basis points of hikes here by, by the Fed over the next yeah. couple of quarters. Ira, we spoke to Randy Crozen earlier. He was cautioning that the lag effect here is six to 18 months. What does, what does that mean when we look at this jobs report? This is reacting to Fed policy a while back. Well, it it might not only be, uh, quite frankly, it might not only be uh, Fed policy here. We're, we're you know, the the higher um, uh, higher inflation and higher input costs for some companies. You know, we were talking about things like corporate earnings. You just had Michael on uh, talking about that a moment ago. And the the 
the thing is, is that you might slow down the, the pace of wage growth, and then you might also slow down the a number of people that you're hiring overall. Um, and, and those things will obviously right. slow down the economy in general. And, um, the, you know, again, this one report, um, and last month was incredibly right. strong. So we still have to see a few more data points before we can make any conclusions. Quickly, Ira Jersey, what is a normal... 10 year real yield. Is it a hundred basis <laughs> points? What I, I, it's been so long. I don't remember what's normal. Well, I, I don't think there is a really a normal, you know, real yields have trended lower for 40 years. So we're, yeah. we're kind of making new real yields here. Um, I, I think a, a real yield somewhere between 50 and a hundred basis points on, on uh, 10 year tips is, is probably what I would consider a neutral range. Um, I, I think the risk right, right. now and, and something that the market needs to see <clears throat> is even right. higher real yields in order to slow the economy just enough to, uh, um, to get inflation much lower. Ira Jersey, thank you so much. With Bloomberg Intelligence, he will publish today so you can read it on Monday and Tuesday in America. Mike McKee, one more insight quick. Yeah, a couple of uh, late statistics <clears throat> here. Labor force prime age participation rate reaches 82.8 percent, highest since before the pandemic. Uh, we wow. also have 12 cool. million uh, 852,000 people working in manufacturing. That's the most since 2008. So wow. uh, manufacturing doing very well. And then we mentioned seasonals earlier. Only 6,000 right. added. So seasonals were not a factor. Okay. I don't care. Am I prime age? Uh, can I take the Fifth Amendment here? Okay. Or I'll just kick that over to Anna. <laughs> Anna, Anna Edwards with us. And we're going to finish strong here with someone that is truly devoted from Brexit on and before Brexit to the strange politics of her United Kingdom. Anna Edwards, our heads are sprinting, uh, spinning. Who are the tiny, tiny group of people that anoint your next prime minister? Right. Well, it's the Conservative Party membership, and that is, yeah, a subset of the voting public, a very, very small subset of the voting public. They tend to be whiter and older than, than, the, uh, than the average here in the UK. But they make that decision. Many of them have made that decision already. We get to find the results. Right. When you're on a holiday, I think, uh, Tom, on Monday. We talk about the first Tuesday of November. When does Labour get to participate in the election process? Well, that's an interesting one because officially, not for another year, two years into 2024. How could that be? But whether, whether there could be... Well, we had the last one in 2019, do you remember? That's the one that Boris Johnson won. And so then there's five years to the next one. But we oh, could... Okay. See, an emer we could see uh, the Conservative Party decide to call an election before then. They can try to do that, but there are rules. The, there are rules as well. What is the distinctive <laughs> difference from where you sit, Anna, between Truss and Sunak? What is the, that distinctive difference for these 12 people voting on them? Well... A lot of, uh, yeah, a few more than 12, but I get your point. A lot of it comes down to tax. Uh, soon as, sorry, Liz Truss has been promising not to increase taxes. She wants to cut taxes. There's concern what that does to the public finances, what that does to interest rates in the UK right. as well. Sunak has uh, suggested that he doesn't like her economic policies. So there is a big divide. Also, Liz Truss, and this is crucial, has set about uh, wanting to uh, at least address whether we need a new mandate for the Bank of England. So that'll be something people are watching by Monday, Tuesday. Anna Edwards, thank you so much. And thank you so much for joining us for the last uh, two days as well. Of course, Anna's promised that on our next road trip to London, uh, she will uh, join us at, at, to watch the Tots play at, you know, North there of London. <laughs> this is a football bit. reference, I we think. We will see football reference as well. Yeah, it's the Tots. Okay, good. Let me go through the market here, folks, to prepare you for the rest of the morning and really driving towards John Farrell's important conversation with the Secretary of Labor Futures off of this jobs reporting, critically, the negative revisions, bringing the big number uh, down to, a, well, sort of a smaller look-see here is maybe what the Fed wanted. We went from 300 15,000, and you take away a negative 107 of revision. So it's a 200-ish number. That's what they liked in the markets. Futures up 25. Dow futures up 180. Uh, SPX back to a 4,000 level. The Dow a bit under a 32,000 level as well. I'm just saying that to aggravate John Farrell. The VIX, 24.21. We hope you enjoy your Labor Day. This is Bloomberg. Good morning.